Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to our sunset safari on this beautifully hot and windy day. I'm down in Amakala Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape and we have started our afternoon in the best possible way with a whole lot of stripes, a very big dazzle of zebras enjoying the sun and of course the breeze as well. My name is Tess, I'll be taking you out for your afternoon adventure today. Behind the camera is Morgan and we are very happy that we are starting with some stripes. It's always a good way to start your adventure. So thank you very much for joining us. And if you have any questions, any comments, anything that you'd like to share with us, or even anything you'd like us to look for for you or topics to discuss, please let us know. We can't wait to hear from you. It is your safari after all. So please don't be quiet on the back. Let us know what is on your mind. has been a scorchingly hot day in Amakala, well over 30 degrees Celsius. It's been an interesting one, but I'm very happy that this breeze has picked up to keep us cool. Ah, oh, Sandy Rocks, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm so happy that you're enjoying the zebras. I'm sure that they're really loving this breeze this afternoon. It's been so, so hot, and so this breeze is giving us and them a little bit of a a rest from that very intense heat. But what else would you like to look for today, Sandy Rocks? Let me know. Anything else we can try for down in Amakala? We have got quite a lot of very different wildlife here. So this is the plains zebra, but it is also possible to see the mountain zebra. And this lovely dazzle has probably been hanging around here most of the day. It's a mixture of stallions, mares and foals and it looks like all of them are in some form of movement whether it's a flicking tail or flicking the head, grooming, playing with each other, it's just absolutely fantastic. Oh that little foal is tiny tiny, there's two very small foals right in the middle. I would say they're only maybe two or three months old, they are still very young. Well, this is one of the best seasons in the bush. If you are wanting to see baby animals, this is it. Suzy98, welcome. I'm so excited to see what today holds as well. I think it's going to be a good one. When we can start with zebras that are this relaxed out in the open, it's always good. Some of my favorite species I'm hoping are going to come out today. Oh, there's some impala rams coming in to join us from behind. They're still quite young, but we'll wait for them to get a bit closer. If you do see red movement in the back, it's those three young impala rams. But I'm hoping for more than just the impalas and zebras today. I really want to see some giraffes. They are endangered. They are beautiful. And of course, they're always just such a good compliment to zebras. But maybe some spots would be good today as well. Maybe we can see if we can find the amigos, the three young male cheetahs. We didn't manage to see them this morning. And I'd like to know if they've had some food yet. They were hunting yesterday, so they must be hungry. Oh, the zebras are starting to feed again. So they're not worried about the cheetahs, even though the cheetahs have chased probably this exact same dazzle right here in this open clearing. They're not really too worried about the cheetahs. The stallions in particular are really, really prone to kicking. <laughs> the mares will as well. And the cheetahs would be taking a brave chance trying to go for these little foals in amongst all of those very adult hooves. But for now, you can see that the zebras have kind of the same idea. They're also wanting to, some food. They are wanting to feed, they are wanting to graze. I wouldn't be surprised if they try and find some water a little bit later on, on such a hot, hot, hot day. But speaking of the heat and speaking of the wind, I think it's time for you to go and have a look at what the weather is doing across all of our locations for the afternoon.
a beautiful way to start our sunset safari here at uh, Juma with this amazing uh, dead knob thorn tree. I'm at Galago Pan at the moment and uh, while I'm this side I just heard some Neolas calling a little bit earlier this afternoon alarm calling this side so that's why we are going to try and see if we can follow up on any thing around here. Good afternoon everybody, my name is Cedric Dold and behind the camera we've got uh, Darby uh, on uh, Rusty. So, yes it is sunny, can you believe it? It is sunny here at uh, Juma this afternoon and I am so so happy about that, or well, for now. Uh, let's not gonna, I'm not gonna try and jinx anything, let's just actually not talk about weather. I think that's a, every time I do talk about weather then it rains. So anyway, so yes, I heard some uh, Niala alarm calling behind uh, the camp here at Galago Pan this afternoon, not too long ago, maybe about an hour, hour and a half ago, uh, maybe towards uh, Gauri Dam. And I think what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to see if we can head slowly towards Gauri Dam. Just got to take a look around there and keep our eyes peeled. Maybe Thalamba might be around, maybe Marips, never know. So I'm going to just take a look and see what else we can find around that site. So. I think while we're on that mission, we're going to get this going, Dobby. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. I've got my rain cover on here on my dashboard. I think I'm just going to put it down for now. Because there is still a lot of grey cloud out further. So, yeah. Anyway, as I said, I'm not going to talk about weather. I don't know why I keep on coming to, back to weather. All right. So, I'm hoping that you guys are going to send in whatever you want to see this afternoon. Please let us know. I would love to try and search for whatever. Julian definitely, um, it's nice to see Juma in sunlight this afternoon. I think it's fantastic, but for now. And uh, the humidity is just a lot, it's very humid, very humid. Okay, I'm just going to take it a little bit slower. It, the roads are still very sticky and uh, s uh, slimy around this area. Uh, the water level is quite high. Um, I think everything is so saturated, but it's fun. This kind of weather, this kind of uh, with the sun, uh, sunshine at the moment, I think what's going to happen is that we're going to get some amazing little critters coming out for the afternoon. Oh, 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 I saw a dummy flying from one side to the other. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to sit here and listen out a little bit. Maybe we can pick up on whatever has been alarm calling this afternoon. Let's see if we can hear it from this side. All right, well, we are going to continue towards uh, Gauri Dam. Let's head back to Amakala as Tess has still got those beautiful striped animals. Oh, Cedric, good luck. I think some rosettes would be absolutely spectacular this afternoon. I wish I could see Maribs or Tlalamba. Ah, oh, I miss them. But I'm very, very lucky to be here. And let me tell you, this zebra herd is incredibly cute. That little foal is so relaxed. It's not worried about us being here at all. And if you have a look on its face, it's got kind of these black markings, almost where it looks like the hair is completely rubbed off. Oh, please turn your head a bit more to the side. Very cute little one. So this is a pretty distinctive fall. We've seen this fall maybe last week as well, but haven't seen it since. It's been quite elusive with the rest of the dazzle. But when the dazzle's here, this fall is very, very sweet. Look at it trying to cuddle mom while she's feeding. Oh, that is adorable. So this is very typical young zebra behavior, sticking very, very close to mom especially when so young and only when they get to a little bit older a few months old maybe three to four months old closer to five months anywhere in that window they start venturing further away from mom and they start becoming a little bit more bold but for now <laughs> the boldest thing about it is when it flicks its nose like that it looks incredibly cute but also those stripes are spectacular but that kind of blackened face is immediately what caught my attention the first time I saw it. In the shadows it's a little bit harder to see. It's 
So it looks like the hair, I'm actually picking up my binoculars so I can have a closer look as well. It looks like the hair has kind of been rubbed off a little bit just on the side under the eye. Daniela, it works both ways with little um, folds like this. So for the first while, it'll only be mom and baby that groom each other, and particularly mom grooming baby. But when they get older, then they start socializing with the rest of the dazzle, and then what happens is they all start grooming each other, they start playing as well, and that is how they develop their social bonds. But the crucial time is pretty much in that first week to two weeks, Mom will keep the baby a little bit separate and the reason for that is because the baby needs to be absolutely sure of which one is mom and the best way to do that is by learning her calls and only her calls for the first little bit but also learning her smell and the look of her, her patterning, her stripes and so that kind of bonds them so that if something happens, if those cheetahs were to come back along or the lions move to the side of the property and they started running through this clearing the foal would immediately know which one is mom and which one is the most important to follow. And if they get separated, she can try and find her mom again or his mom again. So for the first little while, it's very exclusive mom and baby only. And then after about two to three weeks, then the rest of the, the group will start getting involved. But you'll see even at a few months old, I mean, I don't think these two little foals are older than three months. But let's say even if they're two months old they're still sticking very close to mom but it doesn't mean they don't socialize with other zebras just that most of the time they are still with mom and every now and then they'll venture out and start chatting and grooming with other zebras <laughs> excuse me i'm sneezing already <laughs> oh, but when it's behind mom it is impossible to see it's still so little Wild Earth is looking for unique wildlife sightings filmed by you. They can be old or new, from anywhere in the world, and filmed on a camera or on your phone. In return, we will give you cash, an opportunity to win a prize, and a chance to see your clip on TV with your name in the credits. It's easy. Head over to wildearth.tv forward slash content to find out more.
opened and uh, I thought quickly I decided to uh, come and take a little bit of shelter under a bush willow but on top of that I do want to explain one or two beautiful things and facts about this amazing tree. As you can see a bush willow, a combretum family. Now combretum is all the combretum families around or combretum species of trees do have four wing pods so if you take a look at all these beautiful little pods they've got four wings am i right there darby Perfect. see one two three four all right now with all these pods so even like your leadwood if you look at your leadwoods that's a part of the combretum family but there's lots so what's interesting about these little pods and a lot of people have said quite often and i've done it before as well to make some tea and I've always explained how to make this tea because it's a very nice tea. I enjoyed it. Uh, it tastes a lot like bush, like almost, I can say, a sandy tea, but it has got a beautiful flavor to it. And of course, how you make this tea. First things first, you always take out the seed that's in the center of the pod. So you take the two, two sides like that and you just open the pod like that. And then you can see that beautiful little seed inside. And of course you scrape that seed out and then you put the rest of the pod, both of the little pieces that you broke, broke off, you put that straight into boiling water. And you take a lot of these pods together, do the same like that with like a hundred of them and put it in a nice big pot of water, bring the water to boil and of course then it really draws out all those beautiful flavors from uh, these pods and you can make an awesome, awesome bush willow tea from this. Um, but of course those uh, little seeds are quite toxic. I said to uh, one of my friends many years ago that he did to drink uh, uh, quite a few of these pods uh, with a seed that was still inside of it and it gave him hiccups for almost three days straight. And I'm talking about proper hiccups like <gasps> all the time and could not sleep at night so those uh, the seeds inside of the pod is quite toxic so always remove that seed and then of course with this beautiful tree for firewood it is very hard wood it's one of the hardest and heaviest woods that we do have around here like most of the combretums like the lead wood the lead wood is our heaviest wood in this area and of course the bush willows are just not too far behind the lead wood and it's always nice using them for like stumps for like um, if you're going to build a fence around the house you can actually use these things as of course you'll like, like uh, what you call it posts so you can pretty much put one every two meters and put the wire across so very nice to use this Kelly really is definitely there's so much to use here in the bush for tea I think uh, I reckon uh, uh, the bush has got so much other stuff as well tea it's got uh, nice fruits it's got beautiful you can get water you can get so many different things here in the bush and i think you just have to really be observant and really kind of take a look on what you know about the bush to actually kind of get and draw those things out it's fantastic fantastic i love it but anyway i think i'm going to quickly get it as i see there is some more rain coming through so i'm going to jump into the vehicle and move on while we can Moral Lee, a nice bush hour. Yes, I don't mind. The, the rain is not so bad. I mean, it's just unfortunately, you know, it's been raining for the last five days straight, non stop. But it's nice just to get a little bit, uh, you know, wet. It's no problem. I don't mind. And it's very humid, so at least it's not cold. At least it's not winter rain. Winter rain is different. If you've got winter, winter rain, we actually then you'll find that. Uh, that's a little bit, that becomes a little bit miserable, but summer rain, that's fine. No problemo. All right. We've got a lot of these round leaf teaks here as well. See all these bushes here? Beautiful round leaf teaks. All right, well, we are going to continue just to just scan this area. Let's head back to Tess to see what she's got down in Amakala. So I don't know if the wind direction changed on this side or what, but the zebras all of a sudden changed direction completely and now they're almost trotting off in a line. 
straight towards a small herd of impalas. I don't know what it was. We didn't notice anything obvious, but of course our noses are not nearly as good as the zebras. So maybe they picked up something on the wind and they just decided, nope, wrong way. We're going the other way instead. Look at that, a whole lot of very pretty zebra bums walking away. Lots of stripes and those beautiful satiny looking tails. Of course, as much as zebras are really big and don't have that many natural predators in this area, because you would think having lions around would mean that they would be ultra nervous. They are, but the lions aren't close by and they probably know that. But the cheetahs won't often go for them. There aren't spotted hyenas here, only brown hyenas, and I doubt they would go for a zebra. But regardless, when they feel nervous, look at that behavior. They're chasing the impalas off and they're sticking together in a tight knit little group. Those foals will be kind of hanging close to mom, somewhere in the middle, and the herd will be moving off to a spot where they feel a little bit more comfortable. But isn't it amazing how every direction change they've taken so far? It's like they're thinking with one mind. They're all doing the same thing at the same time. So whatever has caused them to spook a bit, it's initiated that basic instinct of Okay, this is what we need to do, and they're immediately doing it. There's no hesitation, there's no fighting about the direction. They just know instinctually where they need to go. Wow. Spice, the specific survival rate of young zebras will depend area to area. It can vary as much as, or well, as low as 30%, I suppose, right the way up to about 60%. But it'll depend on the area that you are. For Amakala, I actually don't know what the survival rate would be, to be honest, because I can't think that there would be that many natural predators here. Because there's only one pride of lions and the cheetahs don't often go for them, although they have actually taken a zebra fall before. I believe there was a kick there. Wow, sorry, I wasn't actually looking. Um, so for, for this particular area, I wouldn't think that the survival rate would be particularly low. It looks like there's quite a few teenagers in that group as it stands. But if there is a specific survival rate for here, I'll definitely try and find out for you, Spice, and let you know. Uh, it would be quite hard to study though, because you'd have to take every single zebra into account and every single zebra fall. But of course, none of the plains game are immune to predators. And so regardless of how good a survival rate it is, it doesn't mean that they're safe. Also remember in places like this, drought are also a factor. Drought and other weather conditions are also factors. There we go. And even cold here can be quite intense. If you've got a very late fall somewhere towards the winter, the temperatures here at night are very, very cold, so you could even lose a fall to extreme cold. Hypothermia. Or hyperthermia. It's very hot too. Now it's interesting if we compare the survival rate of zebra falls to cheetah cubs, since cheetahs are something we're going to be looking at in a nice comparison of stripes to spots. Cheetah cub survival rate can be as low as 5%. In some areas it averages about 35%, like the Kruger National Park it averages 35% survival rate. So the highest percentage or average survival rate for cheetah cubs in the Kruger National Park would be about the same as the lowest average for zebras probably in the world. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a very different playing game, very different playing field. I suppose cheetahs are just much more vulnerable than something bigger and bulkier like a zebra. But I have a feeling the survival rate here would be much higher than somewhere like the Kruger National Park because of the immense density of spotted hyenas, lions, wild dogs, leopards even. 
there's a lot more there than there are here just pure densities so the survival rate there would be very low versus quite a high survival rate here Philip, these stripes really are absolutely beautiful. And each one is unique. It's like a fingerprint. It's absolutely stunning. They can actually recognize each other based on the spots. I don't know if you knew that. So a very cool thing to be able to kind of show you is how they might be able to recognize each other using those stripes. So if you have a look at the zebras and you can see the stripes on their neck run vertically then you'll be able to see that their stripes on their back are vertical as well but the stripes on the front leg are horizontal they come upwards from the hoof and in the corner on the shoulder it creates a triangle and what that triangle does is allows each individual zebra to have a very distinct marking on the triangle that's a, or on the shoulder that's a triangle shape. And so the little ones can actually recognize their moms from that shape. It's the first shape that they learn on their mom or the first pattern. But also each individual can recognize each other just off of that triangle. So without being able to smell them or hear them from a distance, they'll be able to see which one is which just from those incredible stripes. Has opened up upon me. <laughs> Look at the wind, it is coming down, and I'm not going to stand here much longer. But I will use my little oh, wait, no, there's not an African weeping wattle here. But yes, as you can see, this is a magic quarry, and uh, <laughs> it is really, really coming down with a lot of rain now at the moment. And I'm going to try my best to stay clear in the... Yeah. But this is a beautiful little bush. They are evergreen and you find a lot of them around here. And uh, one thing they are good for is beating fires. Because uh, in winter time when everything else is dormant, all the trees are dead. Of course you'll find that the magic quarry can take a huge piece off like this one. And then beat the fires in winter time. But yeah, unfortunately, as I say, it is now coming down quite hard and I think I need to get back to the vehicle. All right, I'm getting back to the vehicle. And that was, you can see, all on the one side. Ah. <laughs> Yo. Okay, I'm in the vehicle and uh, I am flooded. Oh, even the vehicle's flooded here now. And there's even blue skies to the east, but yeah, anyway. All right, we do apologize. We're gonna, gonna hear a little bit of rustling. But it's just us putting our rain jackets on and trying to stay, trying to stay dry. And it's coming from a side. It's not, not coming straight down, that's the thing. It's coming straight from the side. But this should be over very soon. Right, so our zebras have decided to disappear and that's okay. They're allowed to disappear into the bush if they want to. So what we are going to do is head a little bit further west, going towards the right hand side and we are looking for cheetahs. But it's also a fantastic area for eland, for giraffes, red hartebeest, black wildebeest, warthog. 
so I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that we're going to get lucky. We're going to have to see how it goes. Oh, the wind is kicking up the sand in the road. This area is a lot like beach sand. Very fine sand. Very light as well. It's not muddied down, so... <laughs> When it blows, it blows properly. The thing I love about Russ is that she's taking good care of us. Eh? She gets us to sightings, like we drive over big blocks. The most memorable experience with Wendy was two nights ago, in fact, last night, when I had a flat tire right in the middle of a head of 400 buffalo and had to change it right there and then. That was by far my most memorable experience with this trusty old girl. The only thing, tough experience on Rusty would be to forget to charge it. Well, she's only broken down with me once and it was basically just a loose steering uh, rod that we fixed in the field. We use big batteries to power up everything. So if it happens that you don't charge it, she'll die on you, right? Since then, she's treated me very well. She's taken me into a number of sightings and you know, it just seems to keep going. Shongile was born in February 2016 to Karula, the Queen of Juma. We watched her grow from birth to enforced independence when Karula disappeared. On the 19th of August 2016, Tandy, Shongile's sister, was on the prowl. From nowhere she appeared and a traumatic fight ensued. That was the last sighting of her on Juma. She disappeared into the wilderness just as her mother before her. Look at that, look at that. There's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy who just came around the corner. That is incredible. That's probably his first solo kill. Oh, and have a look. Here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. Look at that. He's running away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. Run away from this very big animal coming. <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> I believe you lost me there, but don't worry. I found myself again. <laughs> we are sitting with a little bit of a dense view in front of us, but this is a fantastic place to stop and look for animals, believe it or not. So as much as all of these sweet thorn trees make it tough to see, if you're patient and you have a look, you might actually find animals moving throughout this entire section. And that's because sweet thorn, which is all of these little white thorn trees you can see in front of us with the bright green leaves, unfortunately none in flower that I can show you at the moment, they are excellent indicators of fertile soil, nutrient-rich plant areas, and so they are amazing attractants to all sorts of animals, insects, birds, and if you've got them here, chances are you're going to have some very sweet grasses around as well. And so the grazers go absolutely wild in this area. So not only will we have a combination of things like giraffes, kudus, um, and then elephants in this kind of area, all the, the browsers that are looking for these nice sweet thorn leaves, you're also going to have that beautiful combination of grazers coming in for the sweet grasses that grow in the same soil types. So that would be everything from impalas and um, red hartebias right the way through to zebras, even rhinos, anything like that, anything that's a really big grazer will come specifically to soil types where this one thorn tree species grows. So the scientific name of this little thorn tree is called Vicelia karoo. It used to be acacia, no longer. Acacia, acacia trees have changed names to Vicelia straight thorn or Senegalia hooked thorn. So all of these thorn trees that you would find with the very long straight white thorns are now in the Vicelia family. An excellent attractant, like I said, very, very tasty, but insect pollinated, believe it or not. So giraffes play a really big role in pollinating a lot of flowering thorn trees, especially where Cedric and Lauren are in the low felt, something like a knob thorn. Here, the main pollinator would actually be insects, even though the giraffes like feeding on them as well. And those insects will be attracting birds. So right the way throughout any area where you have lots of these sweet thorn trees, 
you are sure to have some amazing bird and other animal sightings. Now the wind is quite hectic today. You can see the trees are blowing around. And so unfortunately for us, it does mean that animals might be nervous. But it's okay, I'm sure we'll find some. Julia, so from what I can find, <laughs> the pods themselves are quite quite edible to animals and the leaves themselves as well. I have never tried the leaves or the flowers. The main part that is consumable by humans is actually the gum. There's a very sticky gum that is secreted by the bark and that has actually been sold as delicacies. So it's a really tasty sweet gum apparently. It's a mix of sweet and sour but more sweet than sour. It's just got a bit of a sour aftertaste and that is sold as a delicacy from South Africa. But I've never tried the leaves or the flowers. Morgan's been trying to convince me to. <laughs> I've tried knobthorn flowers. They are nice and sweet, but that's more of a sherbet-y kind of texture. The flowers on these are a little bit bulkier. But I believe the export of this, this gum was quite a major part of South Africa's confectionery trade for a long time. So that part for humans would be really important. Now butterflies in particular also enjoy these sweet thorns because it's not only a source of food but it's actually a great place for them to lay eggs as well. So this is a pretty important a pretty important species in terms of keeping butterflies going out here in this area. But believe it or not this can actually be an encroaching species too. So as much as it is thriving here naturally where it should, if you overgraze an area that will tend to allow sweet thorn the opportunity to completely take over an area and it actually becomes overpopulated. So if you find a lot of thorn trees with no grass or very little grass in the area, you know that it's been overgrazed. And that can actually cause a problem because it starts competing with all of the palatable grasses for sun and for resources. And then that area becomes completely unusable for grazers. So that's everything from domestic cattle farming right the way through to rhinos, zebras, black wildebeest, impalas, they won't be able to use an area that's been completely encroached by sweet thorn trees. Luckily here the population is nicely monitored by the animals because there are so many animals that love eating sweet thorn here. It keeps it in check but you'll also see that there is no shortage of grass. So it's keeping itself very well balanced considering that the system used to be a cattle farming system. It's looking fantastic. Now the thorns themselves can be quite deadly. <laughs> I say deadly because you don't want to stand on one. It would probably penetrate your foot. But for the animals it's not, it's not too important I suppose for the animals. They've got hooves, most of them. Timothy, <laughs> I don't know where chewing gum comes from. I, I was almost sure that chewing gum was manufactured in a factory somewhere. <laughs> But uh, maybe you have a good suggestion for a tree where chewing gum comes from. This is eating gum, not chewing gum. But it would be chewy before you swallowed it, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know. A chewy tree? Is that a thing? A bubble tree? No? Mm. Unfortunately not. I haven't, I haven't been lucky enough to find any gum on, on any of these trees that we've stopped for. I saw gum on one, on I think my first day here. And it, in, it immediately caught my eye. It looks like something really shiny in the bush. When the sun catches it, it's transparent, but it reflects so much light. And on closer inspection, I saw it was the gum. But I didn't try it, because that is, after all, the animal's food. And there hasn't been very much gum around that I've seen. So rather leave it for them. But I would have loved to have tried it. It was apparently called... Gum du cup. It's a mixture of kind of Afrikaans sounding and French sounding. But that was actually traded as a as a confectionery delicacy, believe it or not. I'd love to try some one day. I don't think I'd be brave enough to try the leaves or the flowers though. But the flowers I will tell you smell absolutely incredible. So yesterday we had a bit of rain. And um, while we were driving through the reserve, there was this immediate 
sweet, sweet, sweet smell just preempting the rain. So just before the rain, there was this beautifully sweet smell. And it was the sweet thorns, and we know what they smell like here, but they smelled so good just before the rain. I could have almost eaten them then, they smelled so good. But I decided not to, lucky for me, because I don't know how good they would have tasted. But um, maybe one day I'll be brave enough to, to try it for myself. Did you know that explorers are watching ad-free right now? Right this very minute, they are listening to the soothing sounds of nature and seeing uninterrupted content. I am shaking with excitement. But don't fret, you can try out an Explorer subscription in monthly, six-monthly and yearly options. Experience nature naturally, totally ad-free. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. The Juma feeds. We have dried off, we got absolutely soaked and it's a bit of an illusion what you're looking at right now, this gorgeous kudu with blue skies. It may make you think that we're having a wonderful glorious sunny day but we're honestly not. I'm on my second change of clothes so let's hope the rain stays off for the rest of the day. But good afternoon my name is Lauren and I do have panda bear on camera. I don't know how this afternoon's going to go weather wise but we will definitely do our best from this side. So we've just stopped on quarantine because we've just finished changing our attire. And Kudu has walked off, but the Impala and the Kudu were looking a little bit alert. Can you see the Impala from here, Panda? Yes, there we go. It could just be the fact that they just got rained on completely and the wind is picking up. The weather changed quite quickly and it's since changed back again. Yeah, they're all feeding and shaking and yes, I don't think they're looking very alert after all. So our plans are to A, stay dry and B, see what else is out there. Gina D, you are saying good afternoon and good afternoon to you too. We will do our very best to stay dry. Oh, it's not easy, especially on days like today. The weather has just been very unpredictable. Now we've got sunshine and it feels hot. 
then the rain comes down, then the clouds come, then the wind picks up. It is just one of these days where they want to show you all the seasons in one go. Let's hope we don't get snow. That's not going to be ideal. But really, I know we say this all the time, on days like this, once the rain stops, animals will get moving. They really do. The birds are now calling. You can hear the woodland kingfisher. You can see the impalas are shaking, trying to get rid of the water droplets. And that means that other animals are going to be moving too, because it's not nice to be wet and soggy. We all know that. You want to be dry. And for mammals, especially to dry off, they have to really shake off that water from their hair and basically get mobile, get moving and get in the sun. Now that the sun is shining. It's nice to see you again, sun. I've missed you dearly. And so has the kingfisher and the impala. didn't catch that name I'm afraid but I mean it depends what species you're referring to animals is a really broad term for all the animals we see out here from insects to birds to mammals to fish in the dams so it really depends what species you're referring to but generally speaking not really most it's just part of life we don't like it but for them it is just part of normal day life and some animals may be smart enough to sort of tuck themselves or nestle themselves away in the vegetation to sort of break the rain but otherwise a lot of animals it's safety first so these in Pala, we were actually with them when the rain came down and they didn't move. They didn't seek shelter. They stayed right there. And that's because it's safer right there. It's safer out in the open. They can see if any predators are coming. They can hear and they can smell. So most organisms don't really. They just wait out the rain because they have to. Some animals will love the rain. They will. It will feel great on their skin. They will relish it. Some may not love it, it's difficult to tell, but they sort of have to put up with it either way. If I was out here in the wild, I would absolutely seek shelter. I don't think I would make a very good wild animal. Leopard Queen, you are feeling a Tlalamba day. My, oh my, I would love that. Tlalamba is our dominant leopardess really on this property. And I haven't seen her yet since coming back. Obviously I came back to really bad weather, which I wasn't quite expecting. So that's thrown a bit of a curveball, but I'm hoping I get to see her soon. She's always been my lucky leopard on my birthday, Christmas, New Year, it was always Tlalamba. We got lucky with Mowati last night and I saw Tavangubi and Shadulu the first day I came back. But other than that, I need to start counting. Keenan, you're asking when is my birthday? My birthday is October 20. I am a Libra. Stubborn but balanced. So I'm very much hoping that is not the next time we see Tlalamba. <laughs> but yes, that's quite far away. I'm hoping we see her way before then. But it is October 20. The same day as my father. I was born on my father's birthday. I was his birthday present. What more could one want? <laughs> okay, and I think we start bumbling. We're way behind schedule. Not that we really had a schedule, but it's time to head out into the reserve and see what we can find.
So we are doing a little bit of smaller focus for now while we're on our way to the cheetahs and we found a very beautiful but very windy spot that is covered in plumbago flowers, the blue flowers and of course some very well half of it's dead and half of it's alive looking old man's beard hanging from the branches of that dead milkwood tree. It's quite a strange looking substance. It's very very strange. It's actually part of the Clematis family I believe um, and supposedly related to buttercups which is quite interesting but it's said to only grow where there's very clean air so I suppose that is a very good indicator that we are in a good spot and I think the Eastern Cape in particular is very very well known for pretty clean air and the reason for that is because we have so many protected wild areas so many private reserves so many farms and so it's not as built up as some of the other parts of South Africa and so we're actually really lucky here to have some nice clean air when it grows it kind of looks like a carpet almost over the top when it's alive it looks like a bit of a a floating creeper if i can put it that way a floating creeper and then like this it starts kind of breaking up and looks just like an old man's beard kind of hanging off the edge of the branches dangling down blowing in the wind it's kind of separated the plant structures a little bit so that it looks like it's a bit sparse but I'd imagine back in the day this would have been fully covered in this layer of green it must look quite eerie with the whole side of a tree covered in a light green blanket see it's catching that breeze quite nicely but I think the entanglement is so good around those branches that these pieces just aren't going to break off. So these old draggly bits look quite strange. I would like to see this old man's beard in a full carpet over the top of the tree but I don't think we'll be lucky enough. I haven't actually seen a full carpet anywhere here Morgan. A full drape. It all looks kind of broken up. I don't know if it's the same as other lichens that only grows on the northern side of trees. Do you know Morgan? This looks like it's on the northern side but that being said at the back the plant also looks much more alive than it does in the front so maybe it is similar. But this has definitely been strewn apart and kind of pulled apart in bits and pieces. But while we have the opportunity to, to chat about unusual things, um, I do have some information on chewing gum, if, if it helps. So it's apparently been used since the Stone Age and chicle gum was initially the first kind of chewing gum. It was made from the sap of the sapodilla tree. Sapodilla tree but that was way back in the stone age so since then we use synthetic alternatives made in a factory so I wasn't quite wrong <laughs> but apparently the modern gum is based on a synthetic equivalent to that kind of chicle gum from the sapodilla tree and it's a rubbery material that's the same material that's used to manufacture the inner tubes of tires so when mom told you not to swallow chewing gum she was right. <laughs> uh, but apparently the name of it is polyisobutylene. Polyisobutylene. That's made into chewing gum. It's mis mixed with plasticizers and other materials that are apparently all food grade to make gum chewable and so that it constantly has some chew. But I don't know if I ever want to swallow chewing gum again. We certainly don't have any sapodilla trees here that I would be happy to use a, a natural alternative. <laughs> Maybe old man's beard is edible. Maybe we can chew that, Morgan. No? I don't know. It seems... Oh, no. I Now that I know that chewing gum is made from the same thing that tires are made from, I don't think I'll ever chew chewing gum again. Even if it is food grade. That freaks my brain out. 
Kimberly, yes, animals love the gum of trees and they actually swallow it. They don't just chew it. Um, so it takes a bit of chewing, I believe, but that it is definitely fully edible and particularly things like elephants, baboons and monkeys love the sap and the gum produced by certain trees. So of course the sweet thorn is definitely one of them, but interestingly enough even fever trees produce a gum that vervet monkeys are particularly fond of. And supposedly it has antimicrobial agents in it and the monkeys know that and that's why they go for it. But how that was proven that that is what they know it's used for, I don't know. It's probably just a, a long shot based off knowing that it does have antimicrobial agents. But at the same time, animals are pretty capable of being able to tell when something has useful properties and when to avoid it. So maybe they can smell something about it. They might just know it's healthy. They might, I don't think they're capable of knowing it's an antimicrobial agent, but they probably just know it's a healthy option and it tastes nice and sweet. So yes, animals will definitely chew the gum of trees particularly sweet thorn and anything like that. Even marulas produce a bit of gum and that's quite nice, marula trees. A sticky substance that's quite sweet. That I've tried. That I didn't mind. But yes, yeah, something like old man's beard doesn't seem like it's very edible. It seems to be hanging on a lot of plant surfaces around here. At least we know we have clean air on one hand. It does also have a really cool Halloween kind of look to it but I don't know that it would be particularly edible because I haven't ever seen anything eating it and it happens to be hanging on most of the trees, particularly in the dune forest, so closer to the coast. So the cleaner air is closer to the coast. It's blowing in off the ocean, so that makes a lot of sense. Where further inland, you're getting closer to pollution and buildup. <laughs> Sean, it is quite a cool name. I've been jokingly calling it Grandad's Beard for the last while and I was very worried I'd accidentally let that one slip into the old man's beard, but I kind of like it. It looks like Father Christmas's beard. There's a few pieces that are really quite majestic looking. I know a few people that could take some tips from this here tree. This side definitely looks more alive than those pieces that we're seeing in front of us. Look at that, blowing in the wind. So that's definitely fuller bunches of old man's beard, which is a kind of lichen, lichen as in lichen, L-I-C-H-E-N, lichen. So it's similar to the kind of white flaky substance lichen that you'd find on the branches of sweet thorn, for example. But I definitely know a few people that could take some tips from there, maybe take a few pieces, stick them on, paint them make it match make it match <laughs> I think it looks quite eerie I've never ever seen anything feeding on them though I would imagine it would make some decent nesting material to line a nest with for a bird though I wouldn't mind seeing that looks like it would be nice and soft soft and breezy <laughs> Okay, we're going to keep looking for the cheetahs and thinking on that chewing gum and tyres relation. And we'll send you back over to Cedric and Juma to see what he has found for you. Yes, thanks, uh, Tess. I'm so happy that we have found some elephants, a young one that's got a little bit of an attitude this afternoon. He's definitely not too happy with us uh, uh, being around, yeah? So he's moving. Okay, I'll have to go forward. Sorry. Sorry, Darby. It'll have to be done. Every time the animals always decide to change their direction when we arrive. Let's see. Let's see where they are going to go. With the traditional stories I've learned that uh, it does have future and a past. If you follow it, you will never ever go wrong in life. It's very important because it contains, of course, the history background and the knowledge of the bush. In each every family, they have so-called a tree or Amarula tree. We'll go there and kneel down and talk to the tree and say, we want success in the family.
I was taught to track by my grandfather. His name was called Jack Shitola, the first tracker in service sense, with the first tracker to habituate leopard. Tracking is my favorite part of my guiding experience because if you don't track, you will never find yourself having joy on the guiding experience itself. It's one of the best tools that you need to have. I'm being good on tracking because it's something that I've started when I was a young boy up to the adulthood. My tips to all new guides, we have to respect the wildlife. Watching an African Harrier hawk hunting, but sadly he flew away. Now I'm not going to go onto the damn wall. I'm hoping Panda can work with this angle. We're at a dam called Treehouse and I just wanted to show you all how full it is. We do have the resident hippo at the other side. But again, I think the dam wall probably could be okay, but I want to just, we're just going to give it one more day. This is very full. I mentioned this yesterday, but it's amazing. When I came here, it was on the back of a drought. It was drought conditions. And just comparing this now, I know that's been a long time since 2018, but it's just amazing how full everything is. Some areas are flooding, and we are due to get more rain. So I'm really not sure how it's gonna go in this part of the world. Floods happening right now in Mozambique as well. But a lot of the dams do have overflows, and the overflows go into drainage line, and there are sort of escape routes for the water. If that makes sense. The dam walls keep everything, keep the sort of shape of the dam, reinforces it if you like, but then there will always be overflows. And in most of the dams, the overflows are flowing. The hippo must be loving life. There can never be too much water for a hippo. Is that a hippo or is that a log? Have I just been stumped? I have just been stumped by a stump. <laughs> From a distance it looked like a hippo but it's not a hippo. <laughs> That's my wonderful eyesight for you all. So I'm going to retract what I said earlier and there is no hippo in this dam. Ray J, you had a good feeling about today for me. Well, I really hope so. It hasn't been terribly lucky since I've got back, so I'm hoping that my luck kicks in. With all sorts of spots and all these new animals that I need to meet. So thank you, Ray J. I have a good feeling too, as long as this rain stays off. Okay, I cannot believe I just thought a log was a hippo. I'm going to hang my head in shame and send you guys all the way to the Eastern Cape. Thank you, Lauren. So on this side, we are taking in a little bit of scenery again. And the reason we stopped here is because on the other side of that valley, there's a couple of open patches with some termite mounds in them. And this area is one of the cheetah's favorite areas. We've seen them here a couple of times now. And so every time we're driving through this section, we like to stop and have a look whenever we have a slight viewpoint that gives us a bit of a higher view into those open areas in between all of those subtropical thickets. Now, unfortunately, I don't see any cheetahs moving anywhere, but it is scorchingly hot. So, I imagine they are hiding in a thicket. At least the wind will be helping them, but regardless, even in the wind, sitting in the sun, your skin starts to feel like it's peeling off. So, <laughs> I'm sure the cheetahs, having a bit of fur definitely helps, but they are not going to want to stay in the full sun 
in this kind of heat. Even though they are daytime active animals, they will still be looking for shade because what's the point in overheating if you can stay cool? It just doesn't make sense to sit in the sun at times like these. Now the challenge with these types of thickets is if you have a look at all of these bushes around us and in front of us and across on the ridge, look at how much shade is actually provided by those little shrubs. <laughs> Not an awful lot. So the angle of the sun does nothing to help this because unfortunately these are not trees that have high up canopies with gaps underneath. They are full lush bushes all the way down to the ground with stems and branches everywhere based on the basic structure of both milkwood and sweet thorn. They're just this massive outgrowth of branches from multiple stems in the middle. Granted, milkwood has one main stem, but then it branches out into a million different little branches in every direction. So those thickets are only great for shade if you can climb into them, or there's a slight angle of the sun that gives maybe 50 centimeters worth of shade on one side or another. So it's very, very tough to find shade, and so that's what makes it even harder for us to spot animals on days like today in these thickets. Because whether you're a red hartebeest, a cheetah, or even a rhino, you're going to be almost inside of that bush in order to try and get yourself some shade. You're not going to be out in the open, you're not going to be on the side of it, you're going to be right underneath it. So it does make it quite challenging. What is nice though is that at least we can see if there is something moving, it has to move from thicket to thicket at some point. And so those nice clearings in the middle are great spotting zones, if you can call them that. Just to pick out the movement here and there when there is some. Now the wind is definitely, I, I can actually physically feel it on one side. It's helping me on one side and not on the other. Did you get that question, Morgan, from William? Amphibians. Okay. I'm going to go with that. I'm going to trust Morgan on this. I don't know if I should, but I'll try. <laughs> He's shaking his head. Don't trust me. <laughs> I'm going to try anyway. Okay. So... William, yes, amphibians definitely will hide in the shade. Uh, they are not immune to temperature changes, although they are better at temperature changes than other animals. So if you slowly and gradually change the environmental temperature of an amphibian, they adjust really, really well within reason. So they just slow down, slow down, slow down to a point where they actually won't notice if they're overheating and they can actually die because they haven't noticed with the temperature change because their body has adjusted accordingly. But in these extreme temperatures, they will still need to find shade, but even better for them, water. Because water, the temperature will stay consistent. Even if they're in the shade and it's really hot, they can go from really hot to quite cool very quickly, and that can also cause a problem. So it's the age-old thing of, if you take a frog out of cold water and put it into hot water, it's going to jump out because it'll feel that it's hot, it's a quick temperature change, it's gonna to have to try and make a change pretty quickly to get out of that situation. However, if you slowly heat the water that a frog is in, it will stay in the water because it doesn't notice that the temperature is changing to that hot because it's slowly and gradually changing with it. So they have very uh, porous skin, so their, their skin is very thin and it's very porous, which means it's got lots of little holes in it and it's quite a thin membrane. And so what happens is they can literally adjust their temperature with the outside temperature very, very easily. And that can cause a problem. So what they like to do is hide either in the shade or if they can, water is definitely a better constant to be in because the water, even if the top layer heats up, the bottom is still nice and cool. It's a swirling system. It's usually a still body of water in these environments. And so that can protect them really nicely. But you will find frogs and all sorts of other amphibians resting in the shade. Um, if you've ever seen a foam nest frog up in a tree or even on a windowsill, which sounds awful, but they do, they do enjoy windowsills and light bulbs and all sorts of strange places to lurk, you'll notice that a lot of the time they are in the shade. So they do have to still try and adjust and adapt, but obviously within reason. Most of the time though we don't notice them actively in the shade because they're in the water, so there wouldn't really be a point in having to find shade. I want to be able to tell you what bird call that is, but I don't know. I'm not 
somebody with it. <laughs> Leopard Queen, you won't believe me when I tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Morgan and I looked for lions this morning, and the only reason we didn't look for them this afternoon is because they went into an area where nobody could see them anymore. So with this intense heat building up today, we haven't been as lucky as the cooler days where the lions have been out and about in the open areas. They were in an open area very early hours of the morning, and then what they did was they went into one of the thickest valleys known to Amakala. And so there was absolutely no chance of viewing them. But if it changes, we have got the game drive radio on. We will definitely uh, try if they are out and about. But in this weather, <laughs> I don't think they're coming out until well after sunset today. <laughs> but absolutely, as soon as we get the chance again, I'm desperate to see the cubs again. I've only seen them once. So I'm absolutely desperate to see those lion cubs again. I'm hoping that the weather plays ball and actually gives us the opportunity to do that sometime soon. We have got some cool weather coming, I believe. Um, I think on the 15th or 16th? Yeah, in the next three, four days. So this area again is covered in sweet thorn, but these ones at least have yellow flowers, so you can see the flowers that I was talking about. So these yellow flowers are really what attracts so much life out here. Particularly insects, and then the insects attract a lot of birds, but most of the bird species you'd find around here would be everything from rollers, and in fact a European roller is not a, a common occurrence here, but I've already seen five since I've been here, so I've been lucky. But everything from the different roller species to uh, swallows as well, barn swallows and other swallows, um, weavers, orioles, a whole bunch of different birds will come around here, not for the flowers, but for the insects that they attract. But the thorns are quite mean looking, don't you think? The thorns are very mean looking. So these were actually all the different acacia thorns, now vicalia thorns, not senegalia. Senegalia are the hooked thorns. So the vicalia thorns, all of these big straight white thorn species, could traditionally be used as needles I believe. So you make a little hole in the back once you've broken the thorn off and you can use it to do kind of makeshift sewing which is quite cool. I've actually done that before and it was a lot of fun. Only problem being it's a lot thicker than a needle so you need some pretty impressive impressive cotton <laughs> to keep up with the size of the holes that the that the thorns create. I would imagine as well that's a good point Morgan that they might have actually been used for tattooing at some point as well. It's a decent use, they are needle-like. I'm sure there are many different uses for that. For us though, the gum is definitely the main part that we want to be soaking in and chewing on. Better than the plastic version, everybody. <laughs> Avoid the tires at all cost. <laughs> uh, it's also really, really popular for spiders because of the amount of thorns it makes for a great stable environment to have a lot of silk attachments to kind of build a web. I can't actually see one glinting in the sun on the right hand side but it's blowing so much in the wind it's very very hard to pick it out the top right hand side there Morgan. <laughs> Do you want me to go point it out for you? You got it. It's blowing so much in the wind I don't even know if we'll get it but that almost looks like a kind of tent spider from the structure of the web. Jazzy sweet corn, sweet corn, wow. <laughs> sweet corn is actually not one of my favorite foods, I'll be honest with you. Sweet thorn, <laughs> that's what I was looking for, uh, is a competitive species and it can outcompete and completely invade areas. Probably its biggest competition here would be the more native species, things like white milkwood, but also things like the palatable grasses, the sweet grasses. Because they grow so densely, they provide better shade than the milkwoods do, even though the milkwoods are bigger. Problem being, you have to navigate the thorns to get to the shade underneath of these little sweet thorns. But they provide so much shade and use so much nutrient that they can completely outcompete grasses. And then grasses, once they're gone, can't really grow back if there's too many sweet thorns. So that's probably one of their biggest competition species out here. 
um, but they can literally outcompete anything if given the right environment. Luckily, this is a very well balanced environment. So at this point, they don't seem to be invading where they shouldn't. They don't seem to be taking over. But there are actually no other thorn species here that I have seen so far from the acacia or previous acacia family. I'm sure there are others that exist here, but I haven't actually seen anything other than sweet thorn. There's just sweet thorn everywhere. Does anyone have any cool suggestions of what spiders could have built these beautiful little webs? We can't see a spider, so we can't tell you. <laughs> but I'm open to suggestions. I'm open to suggestions. There's not that many species that build webs. All spiders produce silk and have spinnerets, but they use it for different purposes. Not many of them actually build catchment webs like this, so who knows? Who knows, who knows, who knows? But I feel like maybe because of the way it's blowing in the wind, I'm tempted to say kite spider. <laughs> but I might be completely wrong. I might be completely wrong, who knows? Who knows? But anyway, it's it's a very cute idea that they've got such a stable little home here. Um, but don't forget everybody, this week we're going to be talking about wild about love. So you can join us, your naturalists, on the Sunset Safaris from tomorrow the 14th until the 18th of February, where we will be discussing animal courtships, mating, relationships in the wild, all of the love bugs and cuddle puddles waiting. We're excited to be chatting through this week of Valentine's Day. So please do join us. Please do, please do. We're excited to chat about all of these things and some of those relationships are truly fascinating so we're looking forward to your questions. Any ideas on what spider that might have been Morgan? A kite spider. <laughs> Morgan's also going with kite spider because of the way that the waves are blowing like kites in the wind. <laughs> 
really good guys this is this is our amazing scientific reasoning as to why that must be a kite spider <laughs> we're doing swimmingly well all i can see right in the center of each web is literally there's an old insect casing you might find as well there's some old defecations in there as well it often gets mixed up and added to the middle to attract insects believe it or not it's right to the center where the web is the strongest and that'll hopefully help these spiders catch some food oh that insect got away there was an insect that flew through and didn't get caught oh sneaky you would think with so many different faces of webs they would have been Ah, oh, they would have been happy to have some lunch, those poor spiders. Billy, yes, spider web can be used for a bunch of things. So it is a form of silk, and in fact, it's the strongest form of silk in the world. So I'm sure if you put enough of it together, it would take a while, but you'd probably get it thick enough to make some clothing. But out here in the wild, it is actually used by birds in particular. So some spiders use their own, some birds use it instead. And what often happens is they'll collect single strands of spider silk and they can use that to reinforce the structure of a nest but also to line the inside to make it nice and silky smooth see what i did there uh, <laughs> but yes birds will use these for nesting and you see that a lot with things like helmet shrikes you also see it with things like flycatchers and even crombecks their nests look like perfect replicas of community web spider nests, the little crombecks from the front. From the back you can see it's got a cup entrance, but the whole thing is lined in spider webbing and little little leaves to look exactly like a community web spider's nest. But it is an incredibly strong substance, so it is one of those things that can definitely be recycled at some point and used again. If you look at bark spiders, for example, they consume their own web every single morning. They build webs that span meters and meters. They can be as wide as three to five meters across the distance between two bushes. They build this immense web in about half an hour. And the next morning they eat it, recycle the nutrients and make another one the next night. Unreal, absolutely unreal. Okay, we still haven't seen any movement. <laughs> Nothing at all, but we have been focusing on the kites. I think that's probably probably how we got distracted. Yeah, I, I honestly have no idea what spider that could be. <laughs> it looks similar to the bottom part of the structure of a tent spider or a kite spider. So I don't know. I'm going to guess one of those because they're small and the webs are close together. But again, might be completely wrong. I'm not that familiar with spiders in the Eastern Cape, so maybe there's a very obvious species literally staring at me and I don't know about it. Very well, could be Morgan. <laughs> Morgan's doing the staring movement. Amazing. All right, I think we're gonna have to start heading towards the other side of this mountain. Um, I don't know where the cheetahs are today. They're probably still in the section somewhere. And I know that there are a couple of other vehicles around that are wanting to have a look for them. They're definitely wanting to have a look for them just as much as we are. So hopefully between all of us, one of us gets a plant. Ooh, bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. I need to move forward in my seat. Whoa, there we go. Might be better. Thank you, spiderwebs. Very cute little spiderwebs. This really is a stunning area. I love this mix of thicket and, and namakaru. So namakaru is now officially the lack of grass, and instead it's little shrubs. So this is not grass anymore, this is shrubbery, little tiny shrubs. Very quick change from the grass we had on the top of the hill to the Namaku route here. And then there's grass again, so that's a mix of grassland in there as well. <laughs> Five different habitats completely intermingled. Crazy cool. So much sweet thorn. So much baby milkwood. So pretty. So many of these huge, lush, 
massive open areas. So good for cheetahs. And all of the planes go. Oh, there's the pods. Yay! I can definitely show you a pod. Let me grab one pod for you. So this morning I was chatting a bit about the exceptions to the rule. I'm going to put it there so you can kind of see it. It looks a bit like a moustache or a bean, a string bean. So this is actually the fruit of those beautiful sweet thorn trees, believe it or not. Inside of this are little pods. Let's see, can you see them? So the darker patches. Ah. Oh. So the darker patches kind of mixed in between. That's where the little pods would be. Covered in a very fine little section of hairs all over the outside of the pod. And this is the fruit of a sweet thorn tree. So fruits are normally looking like apples or tomatoes or little bulbs or anything like that. We'll show you how they grow on the tree itself. Have a look at that little bunch. Absolutely beautiful. I'll move out of the way. So a little bunch of these pods that are highly nutritious and this is considered the fruit of a sweet thorn. It is one of the only exceptions in all of the plants where the fruit is actually the pod and the pod is the fruit. Most other trees and plants that have fruits, they look like little baby tomatoes or apples or anything like that. They resemble a fruit. This tree does not. Very, very interesting. Giant thorns that it's surrounded by so you can see why they can afford to have such easily accessible little pods. But believe it or not, a giraffe's tongue can get around those thorns. That's quite scary. That thorn would easily be the length of my hand, some of those. And a giraffe can get around that with a very slimy, slippery tongue. Fascinating. But isn't it pretty up close? Look at those fine little leaves. The yellow kind of pom-pom looking flower. It is a beautiful tree and it smells amazing. I wish, I wish you could smell it. I really wish you could smell it. It's like a mix of, of jasmine and sherbet. It's a very pretty smell, especially before the rain. I'm surprised we aren't covered in bees being so close to one. The bees absolutely love these. We had a close encounter that yesterday, day before. <laughs> Yesterday there was a massive swarm of bees we didn't notice when we were moving and we stopped next to a sweet thorn tree and there were just these honey bees everywhere we had to move off. <laughs> it's their tree. <laughs> Naturally we had to leave. <laughs> didn't really want to get in the way of that. But very, very, very pretty. I've never tried a pod. I don't think I'm going to try a pod. Not today, to be honest. I'm a little nervous of pods. <laughs> I've been a little nervous of eating random things in the bush recently. Ooh. Angela, I definitely prefer rain over wind. Reason being, in the wind, everything blows into your face, things get dusty, you struggle to hear, and it can still be hot. It is insanely hot at the moment. I burnt so badly today. It is insane. I've got marks all over me, and that was in the wind. I still burnt. The rain, everything cools down, everything smells amazing. It's fresh life, fresh growth, nice and cool. My best safaris have been in the rain, not the wind. Wind makes everyone nervous, but it's still hot. <laughs> but the rain definitely makes it a lot of fun, and it uh, kind of brings everything to life. So I definitely prefer rain. We need some of that rain. Send some of that rain from the low felt here, please. Hukamore. Oh, he is an impressive looking male leopard. Look at that neck on him. He just looks ready for a fight. This is only the third time that we are seeing him that is known as the Hukamuri male. And he certainly has a lot of character and atmosphere. This is gorgeous. Hukamuri having a drink at one of the little seasonal pans that's filled up after that beautiful rain we had last night. First time seeing Hukamuri, isn't he beautiful? 
He's got the babies. He's got the baby. Two of the babies made it away. He's got the one baby. 30 meters away from me, folks. You know, for all we say he's a gangster and he's got a face for radio, we only tease. He's actually highly, highly adorable. Isn't he absolutely gorgeous? Compact, powerful, focused. It's not just Hukamuri and elephants approaching. Look, look at this. I love it. We are back live with some very flat cats. Extremely flat. They are so unbelievably flat. <laughs> But it is in fact the Inkahumas that Cedric had this morning, a lion pride that we know really, really well. They used to be the main... <laughs> Sorry, someone's making me laugh. He's pulling faces at me on the other vehicle. Anyway, I'm going to concentrate. They used to be the main dominant pride on our property. But just with any sort of territorial organism, you will find that the shift and move nothing stays static so even although you think their territory is one property over time through pressure on resources and pressure from neighboring competitors it will shift and move it may go slightly north may go slightly east west whatever and these guys ended up moving further south so we don't see them as often as we used to see them but they are now very very flat hello guys and this pride actually means a lot to me when I first started in my role here. They were the lions. They were the only lions that we used to see. And we witnessed them have a whole bunch of cubs, found many of the den sites, many of the cubs. It was a really exciting time to be around this pride. They suffered greatly from the drought. A lot of the cubs had white muscle disease, which was really terrible and sad to see. But of course, nature's nature. And then they really did bounce back. It's just so good to see them again. You get attached to the animals out here. Anywhere you go, I mean, from all the locations that we have, you get attached. You end up spending hours with these animals, day after day after day. You see cubs grow up, and of course you form a level of attachment. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know, but it happens. But I'm hoping because of the conditions that they get up soon. I'm hoping they're not terribly flat for too long. Rolanda, you are welcome. They were quite easy to find. They are on the main road. I just wanted to check our property first. That's sort of the rule you have as a guide out here. Check your own property cover all bases look for tracks look for signs and if you really don't find anything and it's not going your way then you start moving out of your property into other properties that you can and go to other sightings but luckily they're on a boundary line and we may be able to position in a bit and hopefully get better views at them I always say this, but lions blend in so well to the winter vegetation, but they also blend in so well to the summer vegetation. That tawny color just melts into the vegetation, whether it's drought. And sometimes you could drive right past them. Lionesses just blow me away. They really do everything about them. And they are the symbol of womankind in the animal kingdom. Yeah. 
Sorry, Gwen. I'm just not getting that comment from Hillary. I can't understand what you're saying, I'm afraid. Ah, that's much better. Hillary, you sent cat luck. <laughs> it worked. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving sign language from another vehicle about potential ingui, so apologies about that. I got distracted. Hillary, thank you for your cat luck. I believe it worked because just as I finally understood your message, another vehicle was symbolized to me that there was a leopard in sign language and it was very interesting how he did it. I will show you a little bit later, but he told me there is a leopard. So maybe when the sighting gets full, we can hopefully show you some spots. So all time to Hillary, everyone. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> A lot of the vehicles here know that we're live. So we have evolved sign language, which is not official sign language. Let me tell you that. Frank, really, to be frank with you, yes. Normally in winter, you do find the sort of predators a little bit more active in the cooler weather. Obviously on those extremely hot, sticky days where you feel like you can barely breathe and it's so muggy and claustrophobic, of course the predators are, well many organisms, not just predators, are going to sort of just wait out that heat. Unless you're a reptile and unless you're sort of a bird, the mammalian predators are really going to wait it out. It's just not worth spending your energy dehydrating yourself to wander about in that heat. But that's not to say they don't. When we spent time up in the Maasai Mara, the prides up there that we followed used to hunt buffalo in the midday heat when it was actually scorching. So there's no set rule really. They are primarily nocturnal for those reasons to avoid the heat. They have unique specializations that make them thrive in the nighttime but honestly you will find they get active in summer. Animals will always surprise you and that is because they are opportunistic. So if an opportunity comes their way they're absolutely going to take it. And it sometimes annoys me now, actually, when people say lions are lazy because I, they are active all night. Well, most of the night. You will find lions on patrol during the night, hunting, playing, moving around. Sometimes you wake up and when you actually follow their tracks, you will be blown away at how far lions have traveled. But it just all happens in the night. You just tend to see them sleeping all day, which makes you think they're lazy. But they're actually not and sometimes the amount of energy that they spend in the night is really quite something so they need to recuperate all that thank you Four. Bella, I know, I know. I completely agree with you, best pride ever. It's really hard to choose favorites. Let's reposition Panda Bear because, well, it's just hard to choose favorites. The sign language was, Leopard over there, up a tree sleeping, it's brilliant. Anyway, we're in the lineup for that because I don't quite know where Cedric is right now. But yes, but the, this pride is just dear to me. All the prides are wonderful, of course they are, but these girls and boys are just very dear to me. Wow, there are more of you than I thought. How is that? 
Wow, that's a different view, isn't it? Hello. <laughs> it's really good to see you guys. I don't think you're all terribly happy, but that's okay. That's me. Mistaken, that's fine. Uh, set of speed up. Copy, thank you. Afternoon, any update? Alvis and Garland, Gary Main, East. Oh. Sorry, I'm just keeping my ear on the radio because we have been very kindly put in the lineup. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six Tony bodies that I can see so far. But there could potentially be more. The grass is just so unbelievably long right now. The vegetation is so thick and dense. I have seen the bush this thick before, but of course, if we continue to get more rain, we continue to get more water, it'll keep getting thicker and thicker. Which inevitably... Oh, I just accidentally called Cedric. Whoopsie. Which accidentally will... Sorry, I'm getting distracted here. Which incidentally will, of course, make it really tricky to find animals. I love seeing the sort of contrast between summer and winter out here. It brings two different experiences. And I get asked a lot, people ask, ask me, which is best? Should I come in summer or should I visit in winter? And really the answer is, what do you want to experience? If you really want to get lucky at seeing animals, then potentially winter is better. Just because the vegetation is a lot more sparse and open, you can see further. So it's a little bit easier to see animals. But then it's going to be very monotonous and barren and it's got that cold feel and not much color. So if you're maybe a photographer, then summer is definitely more beautiful. Look at the tawny bodies against the grass. Panda will give you a nice view of that color palette right there. Look at it. Stunning. Some people might be more interested in birds than definitely summer because all the migrants arrive. Some people might be interested in insects. Some people just might like or they might hate the heat and like the cold and therefore winter is better. So it's a very difficult question to answer because both of these seasons really offer so much. Okay, I'm going to find out what is going on with the spotted cat as we sit here with the tawny cat. I'm so happy that you have caught up with the Nkumas, Lauren. That sounds awesome. A little bit of tawny luck for the day is always good. Now on this side we are once again having a bit of a scan and in this particular area we seem to have come to the spot where there are a lot more termite mounds and more open space. So where we were earlier looking out we were in a thicket, now we are in one of those gaps that we were in fact looking at from up above. And you can see how even from here there's not that much space for a cheetah to hide. But what you can see, at least from this angle, there is a little bit more shade than what I anticipated up on the hill. So there are some decent shadows being cast now that the sun is starting to go towards the horizon. And so perhaps, maybe if we are lucky, there might be cheetahs lying out in a shady patch as opposed to hiding completely inside of a very dense thicket of vegetation. We're in a half sheltered spot as well, so the wind isn't as bad here as it was when we were up on the crest. But that does mean that it feels extra hot in the sun. So all the more reason for those cheetahs to be completely inactive at this time of the day, which makes them harder to find, but also that they're going to be in the shade somewhere. I have no doubt in my mind they're going to be either in the shade or in the half shade. 
but I don't think they're going to be in full sun. I really don't. <laughs> Not even warthogs are out on this section at the moment. Oh, there's a big gust of wind. I think if this weather continues, we're going to have rain hopefully sooner rather than later at some point in the next few days because it's blowing kind of from the side of the ocean. It's blowing from the south and the east. So maybe that kind of easterly wind will bring us a little bit of cooler weather that might encourage the cheetahs to get up and move for us. Well, no movement from our tawny cats, I'm afraid. Sound asleep. It'll be interesting to know which... Oh, look at that one at the back. Panda. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Your tongue is hanging out, my girl. You know, it looks like butter wouldn't melt. Okay, I'm on standby three, that's good to know. I um, went into great depth about this recently, but really lionesses are such an iconic species because of what they did for the recognition of the feminine role in the animal kingdom. It's been thought of for quite a while, but unfortunately due to the sort of era of zoology and the era of Charles Darwin, our good old friend, it was a very masculine time. It was a male dominated time. And unfortunately that was projected onto a lot of the science that came out then. And there's an article about, I roared so loud, I stole the lion's girlfriend. And it's fantastic because it really was one of the greatest experiments that shows you that lionesses are not this sort of submissive, um, I guess submissive is a good word. I'm going to say sex instead of gender. Gender is more for human terms. Sex is actually the correct term to talk about male and female. So they're more the submissive sex who are not promiscuous and they wait until they get the opportunity for the male. That is not the case. Not the case through a lot of the animal kingdom. And it really was this experiment with the lions that changed all of this. Lionesses are promiscuous. They will meet with many different males. They are trying to mix paternity to protect their offspring. They are seeking strong genes and they are very opportunistic. For males to be thought of as promiscuous but females not, that's strange. Think about it. If the males are promiscuous but the females are not, then who are the males mating with? <laughs> It's interesting, interesting dynamics when you dive into the sort of just the sex roles in animals and how blurred the lines really are. A lot of the animals in the kingdom, in the mammal kingdom, really rely on estrogen. Estrogen is an important hormone for testicle development, believe it or not, and it's often thought of as a female hormone, whereas testosterone is thought of as a male hormone. But of course, even humans, we have a mixture of these hormones and they're equally important. We've just been so conditioned from history to think differently about the role of the female in the animal kingdom. And for me, from that experiment and a lot of other re reasons, the lionesses really signify that shift in perception, that sh shift in realization. That's the wind picking up again. That lioness has still got her tongue out. Leah, me, me too. Nature is so fascinating. And I think as humans, we can admit that we got a lot wrong. It's okay to be wrong. I need to stop looking at this line. It's making me laugh. And we maybe assumed a lot of things. 
a lot of the time we project our human thinking onto animals. Of course we do because we're humans, but it's not always a correct way of thinking. And that's sort of we, the experiment of intelligence where it was all about self-recognition in the mirror. And they put big dots, I think white dots, on a lot of organisms' heads and showed them a mirror. Many species were able to identify they're looking at oneself and they would immediately put their trunk or their hand up to the mirror, up to their head, sorry, to touch the dot that they could see in the mirror. So they realized they are looking at themselves. When they did this experiment with dogs, the dogs just barked like crazy when they saw the sort of image of themselves and they weren't able to recognize themselves in the mirror. I'm sure many of you have dogs at home and that's also happened. Does that mean they're stupid? No, it means we are. That was not the right test for specific organisms. That is not a uniform test that you can just apply to any species. It didn't work with dogs because dogs are not very visual. Yes, they can see, but not like us. We have better vision than dogs because they are chemical. If you did that test with scents and sort of made dogs recognize their own scent versus other scents, of course they would be able to identify themselves without a doubt, but it wasn't the right test. And that was because back then we applied our human thinking because we can recognize ourselves in the mirror that every other organism would too. But I think now in the stage that we are, we are very aware that there's still a lot to learn about the animal kingdom. And it's important to sort of jump into the world of the species that you're talking about. Prospective, not from ours. So, Leah, you're absolutely correct. The animal kingdom and nature, the natural world, is just mind-blowing. And I think it's foolish to think you know everything. I think it's important that sort of to have that understanding that there's always room for more. There's always room to learn. Jessica, you are right. The rain is not the only thing causing puddles. This is a cuddle puddle. And lions do cuddle puddles so well. I love how tight-knit they are in that regard, and it really is only with the lionesses. I mean, you will see a mating pair lying that close to one another, but it's the lionesses that want to lie, and you'll often see them putting a paw on the other one, putting a leg or their tail. They like to be in physical contact with one another. They are very tactile as a unit, and they learn that from a young age. I guess it's a good way to be if you fall into a really deep sleep and you go off away into dreamland. At least if you've got a paw or two on another body, then they'll be the ones to recognize a danger and can wake you up. I did just chat to Cedric. They are back out and about again and they are going west. So when it's time, we will leave the Inkohomas and pop in to see whoever the spotted cat is. Get up, get up. You've got to work as a team out here and that's why I was trying to contact them earlier. We are offering our explorers another extraordinary Wild Earth experience. Leopard explorers and above stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two at Amakala Game Reserve, picturesquely situated next to Addo Elephant Sanctuary Park. Enjoy an authentic bush lodge experience in the luxurious Woodbury Tented Camp 
and feel the heartbeat of Africa on exhilarating safari drives. Sign up to be an explorer today and you might soon be off to the nation. But it is quite a nice flower this and uh, as I said I would love to know there's so many new little flowers coming out especially after the rains and I remember in 2012 and 2013 when we had those big floods here in the Sabi Sands and I tell you it was not even long after those rains have started uh, we've got some absolutely amazing species coming all up all over the show and definitely got our books out to see exactly what uh, plant species we could actually find and how many but this is one of them I'm not too sure as I say um, it is quite pretty it's got a real interesting flower to it and um, as I said it's got the little pods right on top to disperse the little seeds onto the ground Carter, yes, it's definitely, it's nice to learn a bit, um, even for ourselves, as, even us naturalists, yeah, in the, uh, the wilderness, thinking, oh, you know, we always have to learn more and we we'll have to kind of really upgrade our knowledge onto certain things like this now. I mean, I do not even know what, the flower, what flower this is, so I think definitely today, after today, I will, I will know the name of this. And, Definitely I will go and read up about it and see exactly what it's used for and when it comes up and where it comes up and all that. So as I say, it is always interesting to learn about new things around this area. And of course right next door to it, we've got the most amazing African weeping wattle. And you know the African weeping wattle is one of our beautiful trees that we do have here in the Sabi Sands. Um, very like a fern looking like tree, very soft leaves and they do really get to a big, uh, quite a large size and uh, this is, can be used for ornaments so things for, so like things for like furniture, um, like yeah, tables, chairs because it's got a beautiful maroon color to the wood itself. Of course what you do you take a nice teak oil and we've got a round leaf teak uh, bush around here as well and you try and get the, the oil out of that teak bush and you can actually um, just oil the weeping wattle wood and brings out a beautiful maroon color and but just for indoor stuff not outdoor unfortunately they are quite 
they pray to to termites so if you've got like a windowsill or a door that's really kind of exposed to the outdoors unfortunately uh, that's not going to be a good thing and you know the termites do enjoy the african weeping, uh, weeping wattle as well what we can use this for here in the bush we know it as a toilet paper tree um, of course what you can do because it's so soft you can grab a whole lot of little <coughs> leaves together it depends on how many plies you want and it's very very soft very beautiful soft touch to it and then you can use it as <laughs> as toilet paper uh, but you must watch out, there is a certain acacia tree uh, that is around you, and that acacia has got little thorns under the leaflets. So a small little hook for thorns under the leaflets. So if you grab the, a leaf from the wrong tree, well, it's not going to be a very pleasant toilet experience here in the bush. Karen, you say this flower looks like a sweet pea flower. <coughs> Karen, I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. I will, I will straight away go and take a look at the sweet pea flower. I've got an app called PlantNet, and this app is fantastic. So what you do, you take photos of the plant, and it actually really um, kind of gives all everybody's uh, comments and ideas about the plant. And so I'm definitely going to go type in sweet pea flower. So that is nice. Thank you so much, Karen. See, we all learn something new every day. Sweet pea. Judy H. So yes, you went. You to force flower. Did you say to force here? To force here flower, from Judy H. I must write these names down because it seems like there's a lot of names coming through. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going and no signal up this side. No, African foxglove. Unfortunately, no African foxglove. Um, what's a foxglove? If a foxglove has got a, how can I say? It's a long stem. Say, for instance, it's a long. I can sorry, Davi. I'm just going to quickly shout. So, a foxglove's got a long stem like that, where of course the foxglove's got like a typical, almost like a trumpet. So it goes down like. I actually was thinking about a trumpet and a trombone, but yeah, I've, I've still got it. I'm still confused about that instrument. David, do you know anything about trumpets and that? Like that, that... Uh, <laughs> trombone. I'm sure it must be like a trombone. Let's call it a trombone. But it's like the beautiful purple flower. It's got the same, almost the same coloration as I got it. That almost, I think, could be a sweet pea. I've got a feeling it might be. But anyway. But it, uh, it's got the same color, but the trombone goes there. I've got about maybe four or five different flowers coming off one stem. But anyway, while we're going to continue down Zoe's, let's head over to Lauren as she's sitting with those beautiful 20 cats, the Nguma Pride. Um. Currently on the radio, give me uh, two seconds, everyone. Our Tony Katz, get a mobile. So, there was somebody on standby. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Aha, uh -huh. what is the time? The time is 5 30, and this is us starting to wake up. Just like a domino effect. One got up, the others must follow. Uh, if I'm not sure where they're gonna walk, let's just see. They me oh <laughs> invading this line is his privacy massively. It's important to stay quiet and to stay still on a vehicle.
excuse a rain roof pole. We can't really maneuver the car too much right now. You will see that wonderful pole, but it's better than getting wet. Good job, Panda. Look at this pair. Oh, they love each other so much. And talking of love, everyone, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. And this week, Wild Earth is all wild about love. Oh, yes, we are. And you are welcome to join all our naturalists on the Sunset Safaris from the 14th, which is Valentine's Day, until the 18th of Feb, where we will be discussing, well, love in the animal kingdom. Courtship, really, mating, but also relationships. I've been studying relationships in... Well, love. I'm going to just use the word love, but I've been studying it recently. There's a scientist called Mark Beckoff who releases a book on animal emotions, and love is a really big part of that. So tomorrow I'll dive deep into it, but I am just going to use the word love for now. We're ready for love bugs and cuddle puddles like what I have right now. So please do join us. I love love. I can't reposition right now because we do have a vehicle behind us, so just bear with us. Panda, are you loving that pole? Are you loving it so much? You are, I can see that. Okay, now I can move. Let us just reposition just a little bit. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Okay, is that better, Panda? The cameramen love the pose so much, maybe we should do a lot of focus on the pose tomorrow for the day of love. We'll film the pose. <laughs> now this is an extreme sleepy face. This is pillow face. We woke up because the moms woke up, but we were not quite ready to wake up. Riley, I know. Look at these ones, Panda. The two lionesses up there. That's so sweet. It's such cute grooming. I agree, Riley. It's... It's really nice to see, because it's not a mother and offspring, like you would see in leopards. It is two adult lionesses, really genuinely grooming one another. Is that love? Well, that's what we're going to dive into tomorrow. It's very difficult to determine. We can't even determine it within humans sometimes. It's a very confusing emotion. It's a very painful emotion. It's a very dangerous emotion, but it's difficult to pinpoint. It's difficult to analyze. So if we struggle within humans, then it's going to be very difficult to analyze within other non-human animals. Oh, big yawns all around. You're going to make me yawn and I'm live. <laughs> now they are moving in an easterly direction, so we should be able to follow them. Oh, another yawn, my goodness. It's just so nice to see them. It's also really nice to be with them on a road. If you think about it, it makes sense. The grass is wet. 
the vegetation's long is itchy, it's scratchy. There are a lot of insects in the grass, a lot. The ants will be crawling all over you. Really, it makes sense just to lie out on the road. It's just sand. Okay, you might get an ant or two on you. But you're lions after all, you don't have to worry about being that exposed. I don't really think you'd find a leopard on this road line in the middle of the road. This is a main road. It's a boundary line. <laughs> I can't handle all this yawning. dramatic. Anthony, I know, I feel like yawning, but I can't. And now that we're talking about it, Anthony, now I'm thinking about it. Oh, torture. Okay, let's change the topic. But yawning is contagious and it's not just in humans. It's been proven right through the animal kingdom for those that can yawn. It's a, it's a funny phenomena. Why? But within lines, it definitely is. This sighting happens to be rather quiet, so we're going to sit here for a little bit longer. So we have yet again found an entirely different habitat here at Amakala. This is classic grassland. This is more similar to my kind of training, a savanna biome. And it's just absolutely mind-blowing how much space there is without any shrubbery until you reach the very top of the crests. Now what you will find throughout this area is scattered termite mounds. Not nearly as big as the termite mounds that you would find where Lauren and Cedric are or even where Chris is in Pridelands. These are pretty standard in terms of size. They probably take me at a maximum up to my hip height if it's a very big termite mound. But there's an average of about 55,000 termites in every single one of these termite mounds. But what that means, not to go on a very long conversation about termites, because we all know that they're the most valuable farmers out here. They give all the nutrients back to the soil, they harvest, they sow, they do all the things in their own way. My point here is that there are enough termites to feed more than enough aardvarks and aardvolves and this is an area where we know that there have been some regular sighting of aardvolves recently and also the area where we know the cheetahs were yesterday. So as much as it doesn't look like there's much movement here Underground, there is so much activity that I wish we could see with x-ray vision. I really wish we could see all the termites building their little tunnels. I wish we could see the aardvolves relaxing in their dens. <clears throat> Even the aardvarks or the brown hyenas, or the warthogs. But what it also means is that in this long grass somewhere, there might be some cheetahs hiding out. So we're in a pretty good spot to see a whole lot of very different things and each one completely different to the others. So this is a really exciting spot to be on Amakala. It's a matter of time until we find something and I'm really really excited to see what it's going to be. We are leaving the lions now. Well, they are technically leaving us, but we're going to leave them. 
it's a busy sighting everyone wants to see them so these are going to be our sort of last visuals of the Inkohumas now I know many of you maybe don't know the properties here and that's absolutely fine but many of you do ask where we see animals so just for those that want to know the Inkohumas right now are east of the Mulwanini on Gowrie Main and they are moving east for those of you that don't know the property then just ignore everything I just said but we have pulled out so it is time to pull out by Inkohumas it was unbelievably wonderful to see you again ever since they moved south our sightings got very sporadic and then of course the Talamatis came in which is normal I mean well just haven't seen you guys in so long We are going to go through a little bit of a tricky signal dip here. It's not the most stable of areas. Hi! But at least it hasn't rained and we've had lions. I think it's been a pretty good afternoon. Was it Ray J? Was it you? You said you had good vibes for today. Well, you were correct. Okay, and come up here. Okay, we're going to bumble and see what else we can find. Hopefully we might get that leopard, but you guys are going over to Tess and Amakala. This is amazing. And now she's headed towards the elephants. Yeah, here comes the male behind us. This is the male lion coming over here. He's got, the elephants have huddled up to protect the young ones in the middle, and he's going after that girl. And they are the buffalo going after the lion and the lioness. They're still going after them. Look at that guy charging! Hey! Seems like everyone is joining the party. I'm speechless. This is really, really amazing. Highness love warning. Hyena and Hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of Little Hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Baby Hippo jaws gaping. It's going to make it. It's going to make it. It did it. The baby Hippo against all odds. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Well, it's not as graceful as me. <laughs> He's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's gonna do it, but let's see. The hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go, nearly got him.
we have got an epic battle going on between a powered fly and a drop tail ant. Look at that, look at that. So what's happening is these ants are moving from one, one side to another and these pirate flies are trying to steal the baby ants. I <clears throat> do apologize for losing uh, Lauren there. I think uh, I think just went through a little bit of a bad area there. But yes, we are with me now and I am sitting at one of the rivers, or not a river really, kind of a drainage line here on uh, Juma. And uh, we are just listening out to a little bit of a, a like a, how can I say, the flow of water that's happening around this area, which is fantastic. But earlier I was doing a plant segment and a flower that I did not know exactly which flower it was. So, and then I've got, uh, I don't know, Gwen, maybe you can assist me. Somebody sent me in about the uh, Tephrosia krausiana. 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 Tephrosia. Judy H. I think you are right. I think you are very much right on that one. <laughs> Because I think uh, I did take a look and it looks like it is uh, that species. And funny, funny enough, it is part of the, the pea family. So, yeah, indeed, it's part of the pea family. Nice, something new for all of us today. So it's known as a Tephrosia, Tephrosia krausiana. krausiana. And it's an interesting fact about that plant is that you can actually use the roots for um, children's diseases and as well as for if you got um, oh yeah if you've got a bad cough like a night cough so every time you go to bed and you've got this typical night cough that you go <coughs> at night time then of course apparently as well using and eating uh, or not eating the roots but making like a lukewarm water from the roots and drinking the water, it does help to kind of, uh, I'm going to say, stop that little cough, that night cough of yours. Wonderful! See, we learn new things every day on Wild Earth, which I love. And I just heard a, um, almost said a pygmy kingfisher, <laughs> a woodland kingfisher. Did you hear that? I'm trying to see if we can find it. But slowly but surely they are calling less and less and less. So I think in the next uh, month the woodland kingfisher should be pretty much heading back to Central Africa or northern side. I'm very keen to get towards Gauri Dam because apparently Karen, thank you so much once again for information that uh, there is a monkey's alarm calling that sign. Dylan, yes, definitely. It is always amazing to learn about these plants. I think it's, uh, as I say, especially after the big rains that we've had now recently, new flowers are coming out, new, uh, new colors, and um, I'm definitely really looking forward to do some more flowers in the next day or two and the rain has just started coming down again okay. well it's a norm I, mean, I think uh, Darby and myself is saying well this is it's like just a norm now rain 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 it's like almost feels like the rainforest here yeah. oh, okay well I just want to put my cover on here yeah. just want to put my cover on this side Okay, well, I need to first put my cover on. Thank you. All right, uh, put that on. Because uh, I see it's starting to rain on the, uh, the monitor here. All right, I've got that almost covered up. But how oh, beautiful. Just listening to the water flowing here next to us as well. Absolutely stunning. Well, yes, as you know, this is a live and interactive experience. So if you are watching this on your app or a website, you can just register to ask questions or let me know what you would like to see today or even chat about. Well, we've seen quite a bit already today. However, if you are watching on YouTube, 
please do subscribe so we can notify you of all the other amazing content that we have got to showcase. Be sure not to miss out on any of our amazing moments. So yes, always good to subscribe to Wild Earth on YouTube. Alright, I don't see, I'm just taking a look, this river has been flowing quite a bit, I mean it's a lot of this grass has been flattened around here. Yeah? I still want to go frogging, I am so keen, I am really amped to do frogging. Roller, the automatic drying jackets from back in the future. Oh yes, I remember that. Aha! Yeah, that's I remember that. Or what was it? Hardy? No, Lardy. Uh, what was the guy's name? <laughs> Come on, Darby. And we call him Darby. <laughs> but yes, uh, that those automatic drying jackets would be amazing. I think it would help uh, all of us here at the moment and uh, to stay nice and dry. Now I can't, now, you know, like you've got that name at the end of your tongue and it just, you know it, but you can't say it, you can't kind of put it out there. What is it? What is it? That's probably tonight when I'm sleeping, I'll remember that name and I'll shout it out. It's that old man in Back in the Future, the one with the grey hair. Well, it's not Michael J. Fox, it's like that other guy. Mm. All right, I'm very amped to try and get to Gary Dam and try and see what's happening that side. All right, while well, we're going to try and head over to Gary Dam, let's head over to Lauren and see what else she's got on her amazing safari this afternoon. Well, I have been really lucky today because we do have another type of cat for you all. One with spots, <laughs> not up a tree. To me. But she seems to be very mobile on a sort of really nice open area. I've had some fantastic sightings here. It's a very small female, really petite. People think that leopards are big, as big as lions, but they're honestly not. Leopards are, are really petite, especially the females. Bobby, I have been lucky today. I have. I just came onto Chitwa and that seems to be where it's all happening today. Okay, let me just keep this radio up and we are going to follow. I'm just deciding the best way to follow. With the long grass like this, you've got to be really careful where you actually decide to drive. Okay, it is just the trifecta has happened over to Tessa. Careful, Lauren. Sounds like some precarious terrain on that side. On this side, we're really, really happy. We found our spots to complete the stripes that we started with. The three amigos, and they're lying in the grass 
in that same spot again. Now this is a bit of a curious situation. So actually, I'm glad that we're seeing the cheetahs today and not the lions, because this is fascinating to me. Why have they been in the same spot of the territory for, what, five days now, Morgan? Four. Four. So tomorrow will be five days. If they're still here, that's a really interesting situation. Uh, they had a kill on the other side of the crest and that was four or five days ago. We haven't seen them eat anything since, but they have tried to hunt a couple of times. Their bellies are still a little bit rounded, so they've still got something to keep them going. But why are they staying in this area? What is it about this area that keeps them here? Because we haven't seen any game. We haven't seen a single impala or springbuck or black wildebeest or red hartebeest or gemsbuck anywhere close by here. In fact, they even have to walk from here to get water. So I have no clue why they would constantly be in the same area just hanging out for a few days. That's actually quite dangerous behavior for a cheetah because their scent will be building up here and so any other predators, if there were other predators around, would come this way. They would investigate why the smell is building up and not moving. <laughs> Andy, I suppose that's true. If it feels like home, there's no reason to move, but that's not normally how wildlife works especially not predators like cheetahs they have a home range and they obviously stay within the home range but staying in one spot for very long unless you've got a den site is really tricky but i do have a theory behind it so we have noticed the one with the collar and one of the other brothers has got a limp on the back back leg one is on the back right one is on the back left now we assume this is from hunting attempts because that's the, the most common way that cheetahs injure their back legs. And it's probably just from straining a muscle or stretching too far or even something like the warthogs fighting back. And we have a, or I have a theory, that perhaps because two of them aren't quite feeling up to strength and they know this area is kind of safe, they haven't seen any other predators around here, perhaps that's why they've decided not to move. They're resting until they feel a bit better and then they'll move to another area when they're ready. I think it's about the best explanation of why they would be here all the time at the moment. But that doesn't mean that they won't be hunting. So we have seen them attempting things that have crept up on them, like a scrub hare and a family of warthogs. So if something presents itself, they will absolutely try, but they haven't gotten up and gone looking for food in days. So they're not desperate enough that they need to actively go and start hunting. But being opportunistic, being predators, they'll take the chance if it comes up. They are pretty awake. All three of them have had their heads up, looking around, listening, watching for movement. And I suppose being in the sun at this kind of temperature this time of day isn't a huge shock because it has at least cooled down a little bit. But I can tell you that we are still burning in the sun. So they must have been off in the thickets a little bit earlier and maybe come back out to this area again because there are a couple of small patches of shade around here. But, I mean, they are still looking in really good condition. I mean, look at this boy. He is amazing. He is absolutely amazing. So who knows? I suppose we can only speculate at this point and, and think that we were giving the right answer. Anyway, it sounds like Lauren has managed to find Insumi again, my favorite little leopardess. So let's head over to Juma. I have relocated our leopard, but she's on a mission. And 
Sumi is really on a mission. She jumped up a tree, she went up, she tried to catch a bird. She's at that stage in her life where everything is interesting. Birds, reptiles, amphibians, you just want them all. So she's gonna pop out here, we're gonna get a view. There we go, she's really not stopping. Gorgeous leopardess. she goes I love young leopards there's really something about them is she gonna go up this tree she might she's thinking about it decided against it okay let me reposition you ready panda okay she's there if she walks onto the road we might lose visual there are some other vehicles there We may not have her for too long. If she goes into a thick block, after the weather we've had, that might be tricky. Gwen, I'm not copying any of your comms. Okay, let me just move forward, Panda, see if we can get some sort of view. Okay, let's see if we can try and get any more views of this gorgeous leopard for you all. But as I do that, we're going to send you guys over to Cedric. We have got another leopard here at Gauri Dam. Of course, uh, Karen told us about the, or gave us a heads up about the uh, monkey's alarm calling. And uh, we've got a beautiful leopard that's draped over this marula tree that's fallen over. This is on the other side of the dam. Very far from where we are now. We are very far. So that's why you'll see our distance is practically, I will say, 300 meters. I think we're about 300. There it is. Look at that. Look at the distance. So yeah, very, very fast. I'm not too sure. It is a leopard. No idea if it's a male or female. I'm not too sure uh, which uh, individual uh, leopard that is, but what a find. Thanks, Karen. I really appreciate your, your uh, heads up in that situation and on the monkey, monkey's alarm calling around our camp. But I might, I'm just trying to see where it's positioned because I know if I can get to that side, there is a little entrance there, but oh, it's going to be so wet. You know, the th only problem about this is if you do go closer to the drainage line, um, it becomes much uh, soggier and I don't want to do any damage to the vegetation. So I think what we're going to do, we are going to just stay stationary here and actually enjoy this moment and enjoy the leopard. So if anyone's got any idea which leopard it is, please let me know. And if you can tell me this character and which one and which individual, I would be very, very, uh, can I say, um, surprised with that because uh, I don't 
I think it's a male. That's my my side of things. I think it could be a male just by the size. Leopard lover. Yes, definitely. I'm so stoked about this this find at the moment because, uh, yeah, I really wanted us to find. I was a little bit, uh, how can I say, envious of uh, Lawrence and Sumi. So, but yeah. I'm glad that she's got that beautiful leopard ass there at Chitra, which she's also quite pretty. But yeah, I'm not too sure. Maybe it could be um, Mulawati, because I know that uh, Lauren and Darby had Mulawati pretty much. My heart rate has gone up slightly. In fact, it's gone up quite a lot. This elephant is now two meters from us. Okay, we might have to move here. No? Yes. Sorry, my friend, but you're about to push that onto the car. You see how cross he was that we didn't want to watch him push the key over. That's why we moved. <laughs> say just spend time with animals this is very 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 cool to see this do cheetah males groom each other for social bonding and I can't give you a better answer than what they're actually doing in front of the camera right now I think we lost Cedric somewhere along the way but I'm excited to see if he's got a male or female leopard and who it might be draped up in that tree. Now on this side, we have got a very sleepy cheetah. Not much movement other than picking up his head just like that, the occasional stretch of the legs and the paws and the little toes, looking around and then going back to sleep. Now this is pretty typical cheetah behavior especially if it has been <laughs> grooming time, a hot day. They're still going to be trying to cool off. So by sitting in the wind like that and even grooming himself, he's giving himself the chance to cool off a bit. And maybe this will preempt some movement. You never know. Now, this is the collared male. So he seems to be the decision maker of the three. The first to move, usually the first to initiate hunting. And he does have an injury to one of his legs. I just can't remember which one now. We've seen two with injuries, so I don't know if it's him with the back right or the back left. But when they're walking, they look absolutely beautiful. It's not a oh big yawn. And um <laughs> starting to lick the face though, this is good. Licking the paw, cleaning the face, rolling over. It really is. I'm hoping a preemptive little sign to some movement. But it sounds like Cedric has managed to figure out what leopard we have, so I'll send you over to him. Thanks, Jess. Yes, I'm uh, still sitting here. I'm not too sure. It did turn its head towards us. It could be maybe Marips. It looks like it's got fluffy ears, don't you think, everybody? Look at those ears. It looks very fluffy to me. I don't know. It might be Marips. We haven't seen him for quite a few days. Almost a week and a half now. So maybe it's him. Because to me it just looks like it's between a male and a female. Cedric, did you say Cedric? Uh, well, <laughs> well, there was a good spot. Yeah. I kind of uh, heard the monkeys alarm calling and all that. And as you're driving this side, I just kind of, you know, just at the corner of my eye, I saw something lying over the like uh, the log, and or the fire fallen over a tree, and it just didn't look like it should be there, like out of place. And then I told Davi, oh, "There's a leopard. There's a leopard." And uh, yeah. Got to see this one. So yeah, 
just by a chance. Some, you know, sometimes it's just luck. I mean, that leopard could be lying on another branch or could be lying one meter further back and you would not even see it. You wouldn't even know it's there. So and we would have been driving around here yeah, looking for practically nothing. No, not nothing, but we wouldn't be able to see it from any other position. But I think this uh, leopard is going to be lying here for a while because it's nice and cool. It's not the greatest uh, day for them to move around. JJ, you say you look so lonely. So lonely? Yeah, I, know, I didn't copy too nicely. But JJ, if you're saying it looks so lonely, well, look, leopards are solitary. I mean, uh, they're solitary cats. They don't mind being by themselves. I think it's ideal for them. That's uh, that's. Uh, any time you'll see more than one leopard around or together is of course if it's a female with cubs or if it's a male and a female that's uh, copulating um, that's the only time that you'll see more that's two cubs together of course you know uh, that's another way but other than that most of the time they like being by themselves and yeah, this leopard is so so relaxed it definitely is not gonna move anytime soon well i'm hoping it does it'll be nice to see and if it does move i'm hoping we can maybe go around maybe around to get a go pan and go and see him that side but for now we shall just enjoy him from a distance oh, oh there you go Look at the ears, it's fluffy. That, I'm sure that's Marips. Please send me your comment about this. Cindy D, I, I agree with you. I think Marips won't be happy, but th I think this is Marips. I've got like 95% on this. 95%. Don't you think? Please put your vote in. Let me know. And I agree. I think Cindy D. I'll never call Marips a, a female again, ever. Bad choice for Marips. Because there's only one, there's only one leopard that's got those fluffy ears like that. Tom, you say, what furry leopard? What's a furry leopard? Sorry, Tom? Uh, Gwen, uh, your comms is breaking up badly. Ah, uh, Tom, whose territory is a leopard in? Well, this area is, of course, coming to a female, will be the Tlalamba. This is Tlalamba's territory. Um, coming to a male, there's two males that will pretty much occupy this area. I've seen Molawati here. Of course, he's the most dominant male of this area by far. Um, actually, not. I'm not, actually, I'm not going to say by far, because Tavangumi has been pushing into this area as well quite a bit, and I've seen Tavangumi at uh, Gauri Dam. So Molawati and Tavangumi is your two dominant males that'll be in this area. But with Molawati and Tavangumi's territories, this is kind of part of the area where it really kind of overlaps with the, with the territory. So one day. One day, Molawati and Tavangumi might end up at Gari Dam at the same time, and we might see uh, a confrontation between the two males. Yeah, that's 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 my reps. That's that's fluffy ears. Definitely all fluffs. Gwyn, has anybody sent any idea on uh, what they uh, who they think this is? Jaska, you also think it's uh, Marips, Mr. Fluffy is. Yeah, Jaska, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, I'm getting, well, I think most people will think that. So, yes, I'm definitely going with Marips. So he's a, if it is Marips, he's still a young male. So he's still in father's territory, that's Molawati. And um, so he's still like a nomadic male. So this young boy hasn't got a set area yet. He's just 
is just between two and a half and three years old in that region. And so he's like still wandering around, still on borrowed time, you know, hanging around in this area that he knows. He knows this place quite well. He knows the territory of his father or this area of his father's uh, because uh, Tandi, his mom, of course, she passed away last year. She used to hang around in this area as well. So definitely he has been back and forth around Gary Dam towards the southern side of our camp, southern side of uh, the Juma property all the way into Chitwa, but he's all over the show, he zigzags. It's a very difficult leopard to track, especially these young males, because they zigzag, they don't, if they, he's not marking a territory, so he's not on a set, uh, set path. And sooner or later, give and take in the next few months, maybe at, usually at about three years old, three and a half years old, the father, the dominant male, Molawati, uh, will not tolerate his son's presence anymore in this ter in this area because at that age, um, Mareps will be become like uh, as they say sexually active. In other words, he will be then start starting to look for females. It's in heat, uh, and of course his father's going to say no, 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 no. You're not going to hang around Jay anymore, and he's going to push him out of this area. And sometimes uh, young males can travel great distances to look for a, a void in the Kruger Park or the greater Kruger Park and looking for an area that they feel that they can start off a territory of their own and then of course start expanding that territory the older they get. But for now he is having a Monday afternoon lazy nap. Yeah, thanks as well. Thanks, James. Richard, yes, I know that you're very good with your IDs on the leopards as well. I do appreciate your uh, your comment there as well, thinking that it is my reps. I mean, which other leopard has got such fluffy ears around here? <laughs> Not many. And the monkeys are still, the vivid monkeys are still alarm calling quite, uh, quite profusely at the, the lodge area. Because they can see him, uh, but he's not really too phased about it. Sl <laughs> Sledrick, Sledrick, interesting. Sledrick, a uh, cat that's the best climber. Look, a leopard is fantastic. They are agile, they're quick up into a tree. I've seen them chase after monkeys, after baboons. So a leopard uh, climbing ability is phenomenal. I mean, as since from the when they cubs, they start climbing to really get out of the uh, out of a danger area of hyenas and lions, so they can climb right to the tip of these small trees and that. So they really learn at a, at a young age. So a leopard is very fantastic at climbing. Another cat, uh, you're looking at something like maybe a genet. A genet is a good climber as well, so I've seen them and really um, climb quickly up into a tree and maneuver quite quite well around the branches. But coming to the size, you know, a leopard is large. I mean, a male, well, Mareps is not a full grown male, um, but a full, full uh, grown male is what, 75, 80 kilograms. So you can imagine that with that weight and you're climbing into a tree and you're jumping from branch to branch, chasing things, you know. That's, that's, the agility is phenomenal. And how many times has Marips' mom, Tandi, lay on a dead branch, like a dead tree like this, or fallen over a tree? Many, many a time. I think I've seen Tandi lying on these fallen over trees in the last uh, 12 years. Whew, I can't even put, put a number on it. But they do like it. A nice, a nice advantage point for them as well. Nice and comfortable, nice advantage point. And uh, yes, in case anything like a hyenas will come here, you know, my reps knows that he's at a safe, a safe height. When was the last time you caught your breath? When were you last truly amazed? 
when last did you marvel at the wonder of nature? Wild Earth Epic Animal Encounters. Only available on the Wild Earth app. I don't think I have any decent ostrich jokes. I don't think I've ever heard one actually. Do you know any Morgan? Give you five minutes. Give you five minutes. <laughs> uh, Frederick, I'm so happy that you love ostriches so much. They are such unusual birds. They really are. The heaviest bird living on the planet. Flightless, of course, because they're so heavy it would take wings probably the size of these open planes to help them take off. And just so cool to watch. Such unusual giraffe looking birds. I wonder if they would nest in this area. Because females kind of hang out together and then there'll be one male that comes in and they'll nest together as well. So they choose nesting sites fairly close together. It's a bit of a scrape in the ground. And they lie just like they're lying now on top of those nests. I don't think that there are any ostrich nests here. It seems a little bit too open. And too vulnerable up on this hill to temperature changes. Those eggs would, would boil in the sun. So would the ostriches. Slow roast themselves. I think they just found a comfortable spot to be honest with the afternoon. But it would be awesome to see multiple females nesting within kind of a short distance of each other. Kerry, there is indeed a story going around that ostrich eyes are larger than their brains. I personally don't know if that's true, but I tend to believe that it might be. Because their eyes are huge and that head is very small. I mean, if you look at <laughs> how much cover that eye has over the head, or over the face anyway, it's quite impressive. They have to have excellent eyesight because they're targeting very small things on the ground. They eat mostly vegetation, but they're looking for all of the little seeds and things. They're looking for threats. I think it might just be a saying at this point. I mean, if you're looking at it close up, okay, their eyes are closed at the moment for the wind, but there is still quite a bit of space in the head, bearing in mind that most of the bottom part will be for swallowing, so it'll be an extension of the the mouth and the sinuses or the nasal cavity. You can see the ears out the back. I don't know. I think maybe it's about the same size. 
eyes and brain. Oh, shame. I don't blame them for closing their eyes. This wind is gusting like mad. I don't blame them for lying down either. They must lose a lot of heat through their legs because they don't have feathers down the legs. The feathers stop at the thigh. So they must lose quite a, a, an amount of heat through their shins and their big, big, big feet. Oh wow, the one on the left is starting to preen a little bit. Oh no, she changed her mind. Oh, she is. Must be very handy having such a long, flexible neck. We're quickly heading over to Cedric. Oh, it looks like our Marips just did a little bit of a catwalk along the fallen over tree. Thanks, Marips. And he just decided to go plonk himself once again a little bit for that. Now, what was wrong with the way he was? I mean, it looked like it was way more comfy because now it's on a, a thinner part of the branch. But yes, uh, we've got the user-generated content, so we are looking for unique jaw-dropping and most beautiful wild animal sightings from all you viewers to use across the Wild Earth platforms. And in return, you can earn money and win amazing prizes and see your names in the credits on the Wild Earth TV shows. So viewers can go to our website, that is wildearther.tv, and just click on the Content Creator button. And, uh, to find out more about the user generated content. So, yeah, he's looking down. I'm sure he's gonna maybe start moving very soon. So, we shall see him. Let's, uh, well, maybe not. No, I think the wind is gusting. It seems like there's a, almost like a tropical cyclone that's on its way. Yeah, that's how it feels with this wind. But luckily our back, my Darby and myself's back is pointing, or yeah, pointing to the wind. Yeah, no, no, this is my reps. Um, I, I'm uh, put now 110%. But thanks, Shreyas, I, I also agree. Thanks to everybody, I fully agree. This is my rips. If, uh, if this is not my rips, then I shall go and swim across Gary Dam five times, five laps tomorrow morning. Please let it be my rips. <laughs> I don't think I want to swim across that dam, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. well, we'll never know. Maybe I do. Maybe I do. But it looks like he's also got a bit of a full belly there, so maybe... Oh, a bit of a scratch. Oh, yes, there it is. Maybe that's why he chose that position. He's got a... Sorry about the shake. It's just... The wind is quite hectic at the moment. Wow. Well, this has now really changed up now the weather. I don't know what's happening here, but... I can hear the, the grass, look at the grass blowing in the wind, the leaves, everything. It is just absolutely howling. So I think all my ribs must have been here, I'm sure, really from early this morning. Maybe he made a kill and he was hanging around at the back end here. Yeah. Very difficult to get to these areas, especially that it's so wet. Um, but as well with that uh, Niala that was alarm calling just before we went on drive, maybe an hour before drive. And I'm sure it was him that was just moving around. Nancy, yes, definitely I'm going to see this. Uh, it feels very airy and strange and the greyish clouds and the wind blowing and the leopard lying on the fallen tree. It seems like it's uh, a very strange 
strange feeling this afternoon here at Gary Dam. Very strange. I fully agree with you, Nancy. Especially all the dead trees in the foreground as well. But as I say, I'm just gonna, I'm sitting here and I'm gonna wait to see exactly which way he's gonna go. Uh, sorry, the name Fleming Goose. Or leopard Goose. Leopard Goose. Leopard Goose. Do I wear floaties? <laughs> Oh, sl oh, Slender Goose, uh, Slender Goose, uh, <laughs> thanks Slender Goose. Do I wear floaties when I go and swim? Well, Slender Goose, <laughs> no, it would be very strange. I know Darby does. <laughs> he says definitely. <laughs> no, no, Slender Goose, uh, I won't wear floaties. I haven't worn floaties for all many 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 years i was actually a very good swimmer at school very good swimmer and of course uh, gwen has just told us uh, of course gwen is our director this afternoon and <laughs> she's just told me now she she always uh, has a noodle you know those floating noodles when she swims uh yeah you know, but that's like a like a toy toy thing you know that's like a thing that's nice just to you know, play around in the swimming pool but yeah no uh, i've got a uh, I'll maybe have a, a unicorn tube or something like that. That's as much as far as I'll go. Maybe uh, a flamingo tube. <laughs> but yeah, I was, a, I was a very good swimmer at school. So uh, my swimming skills are absolutely immaculate. That's why um, I would love to see the time I can do from one side of the dam, Gary Dam, to the other side. Yeah, I was. Yeah. It's like weird. My, my God. I've got big feet, so I've got long legs, and uh, done a lot of swimming. But this is a perfect area for a leopard now. You can imagine like a habitat like this now, ideal. Thick vegetation, close to a river uh, or a drainage line. There's a dam right next door, and it's just a perfect spot for them. And this is what they enjoy. Nice fallen over tree that it's that he's lying on top of, and uh, a nice little position. So he knows exactly, and he knows this area off by heart. I mean, he's been back and forth here at Gary Dam for the last several months, quite a bit. So he knows every nook and cranny around here. Oh, something's crashing. He's not getting comfortable. Hmm. Jules in New Zealand, yes, uh, my my heart and everything goes out to everybody there in New Zealand for that uh, cyclone, Gabrielle. I know it is, I uh, saw some images to, to, today. <laughs> Darby just fell off the vehicle. <laughs> but yeah, Jules uh, in, in New Zealand, yes, definitely I think... Uh, Everybody must stay safe that side. I think it's very important and uh, health and safety is always number one and uh, Yes, I think cyclones is not easy and it's not pretty so stay indoors do not go out and Get yourself into any trouble And I've also I've got a few friends that stay in New Zealand as well, so I don't know if you know, I know a lot of the viewers actually know a lady called Shanae Wales Bailey. Yeah, no, from, she comes, she's actually one of the guides that used to be at Nkoro, one of the lodges here in the north. She's working at Sangita now, and her family is from New Zealand. So, yeah. Be safe that side, please. After all of the madness of the afternoon, and it was absolute chaos, I struggled to concentrate a little bit at times. We're just going to take it easy now. 
Night is rolling in as well as a storm. And we've had lions, two different leopards here in Juma, Chito and Amakala. So I think now we're just going to sit here, listen to all the wonderful sounds of the bush and watch these gorgeous impala. These and Paula are staying very huddled together because of all of those reasons, darkness and storms rolling in. You don't want to be out there on your own. You want to be with the herd. It looks like we are in infrared at the moment and uh, we're just going to see how far we can stretch because we're so far and it looks like he's just he's turned around unfortunately uh, he's very far with infrared it is not uh, 100% but we will try and see and wait around a bit maybe he does move very soon and then we can go take a look that direction he's going. Yeah, he's scratching, stretching, he's stretching. Yeah, the, the names are, I'm struggling to hear. I think it was Lauren. Lauren? I think so. You think you remember? <laughs> Do you think it's Lauren? Darby thinks you remember when you said Lauren, so I I'm going <laughs> to go with that one. The Rolex, the Rolex, the Rolex. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I mean, I'm not too sure when. Um, well, look, I give and give and take. Um, the reps will disperse in the next. I say, it's, you know, I keep on saying it, you know, and it, and it reappears every time. Um, but you're usually about three, three and a half years old. That's when they're kind of really pushing. Uh, the time of being on in father's territory, it's about three and a half is pushing it like far. Um, Shangwa, I remember Shangwa there in the western sector, that was uh, uh, one of the young males, he left at about three years old. Uh, you look at Shasha, that's Lunga's brother, same thing, three years old from this area, he ended up 65 kilometers away from here in uh, the Kruger Park at a place called Biamiti. So that's how far he went. And uh, oh, and uh, well, uh, my is very close to three years old, so as I say, give and take uh, next, I'll say several, I'm going to put several months. Um, he should be moving out of the area and looking for a territory of his own. I mean, he's also going to mature, he's also going to be a man, he's also going to be a fully grown male one day. He's going to also make uh, little cubbies.
And I'm always, I always said, I can't, I want to, I want to be there when I hear Mareps do his first territorial call. And when I say territorial call, it's that saw, that uh, 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 uh. And uh, if he, I want to be there when he does it the first time. It'll be amazing. I'll be like, I'll actually, I'll actually tear up. I'll cry. No, I won't really cry, but it will be a very a tear, tear jerking moment that. But he doesn't do it now because he's not territorial, so. And if he does call now, it'll be very, very stupid because then the male's going to know. Malawati or even Tamangumi is like, hey, but who's here in our territory? Who's, what's happening? Who's this young male that's busy calling here? And that would be quite, kind of uh, almost detrimental to, uh, to this young male leopard. But yeah, the light is getting very tough here. And I'm, um, I'm hoping that we can just sit a little bit longer. I'm hoping that a little bit of the ambient light is helping out as well. Lenny, you say yes to disperse next month because you got a bet with Jade. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lenny, I'm hoping. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to say much. I think. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, you might. You might be very close. You might be very close. It's. It's a very, very touch and go situation. So, other words, you say next month. So March. So you say at the beginning of April, you should we should not get another sighting of Marips. That's what you're really saying because you should be gone by that time then. So, all right, Lenny. Well, let's see how it goes. Let's see what happens from the first of April. Maybe I'll come up with a, a April's Fool's joke. <laughs> yes. Make sure you are watching on the first of April. I say, well, I, I reckon if I put it to the dates, well, April B will be very close. Uh, definitely, April will be very close. Uh, April, May, June. April, May, June. Yeah. Lenny, I think you might have a, a good bet going there. You might have a very good bet going there. I say June. I, I'll put it, my birthday's in June, so, well, actually, I don't want to have a birthday present like that. But yeah, I think June. But it's difficult to say. Everyone's different. They always say it's on Maripsi's mommy's boy. Yeah, you never know. Maybe, uh, or, that's right, maybe on Maripsi does pull an April Fool's. Maybe he disappears now. We don't see him for a month and a half, although it's from now till 1st of April. And on the 1st of April, he appears on Gauri Dam Wall. Imagine that. Well, that will be a good one. Imagine that and with his fluffy ears and a big smile. April's Fools on the Dam Wall. Right, it's, what do you think, uh, Dobby? It's getting tough, huh? Mm. Yes, it's right up that side. And, and uh, Gwen, just a quick thing, we might have to push off to this side and need to go around. But yeah, while well, we're going to try and see what else we can do with this uh, sighting with the Marips, let's head over to Lauren, as she has got some bird that she wants to show you. It really has been a drive of the predators. We've got our very own predator right now in infrared. We've lost far too much light now. And it is, in fact, a woodland kingfisher. But I don't think it really looks like a woodland kingfisher. 
in infrared. You look different in black and white. And of course, a predator in its own right hunts insects. That's why it's here, to feed and to breed. Stock up on all the delicious insects that have arrived with summer and find a mate. Sitting on the signboard that welcomes everyone to Juma, which is the name of our property, this kingfisher has decided I'm also going to sit on this sign and welcome everyone. And you're being very obliging. But I think the word predator can be, well, it's actually not misleading at all, but a lot of people just automatically, our brains are just wired to think leopard, lion, hyena, cheetah. And of course, there are predators everywhere. Anything that hunts another, be it a bird, be it a snake, dwarf mongoose, frog, anything under the ocean. But for some reason, we do just tend to think predators are your mammalian predators. Oh, and off we go. Definitely more obliging than I thought it was going to be. I think he's, he's gone, Panda. He decided that was time up. Now, it is spotlight time. My spotlight is working tonight, which is fabulous which means we may, in fact, get a chance at spotting animals, particularly a tiny chameleon. I've been finding these really small chameleons everywhere. So that's my mission for the rest of tonight. Chameleons, also predators. And I agree, infrared does change your sort of perception. I completely agree. I can obviously see what you see in the monitor. It's a lot smaller, but I see it. And it does look different. And of course, for me, having the, the tool of infrared, it just emits infrared light. The wavelengths are the infrared wavelengths. And it just means that we don't have to shine harsh light on animals, which I think is a fantastic tool. Yes, we do use a spotlight, of course we do, but it's very quick. And the minute you spot eye shine, we turn this light off and we use the infrared. And although you can't see it, we just have our normal camera set up and it's just got an infrared light sitting on the top. And it doesn't look like anything, but it is emitting infrared rays that we just can't see. It's a great tool. The only thing I would say is it picks up on what is ever what's closest to the light. So sometimes when insects flutter on by, they sort of appear like bright white flashes. But I think it's a great tool. It really does avoid spotlighting on all of these animals. And it still allows us to stay with them and enjoy them. I think it's incredible. Okay, tiny chameleons, here we come. Okay, someone is calling me on the game drive radio and I can't find my game drive radio. Uh, I can see you on too, sorry, I don't think anything's coming on the mic. It's just anyway, I'm going towards that thing where I'm going to try around towards Gallagher and see if you can. Okay, maybe he's not looking for me. There is a vehicle behind us, that's probably why. Cedric, do you copy? No, I'm coming to the hotel. Um, I think it's going What a drive, I think we all deserved a little bit of luck today, both Cedric and I. It's been tough with the weather and we eventually got lucky.
a beautiful and windy day down in Amakala. If you are just joining us, good evening. Welcome to another lovely sunset safari out in the African bush. My name is Tess. I am here in Amakala in the Eastern Cape taking you on safari behind the camera. Here's Morgan. We have had a very fantastic afternoon. We had three young male cheetahs called the Three Amigos a little bit earlier having a nice little nap in the sun. In Juma with Cedric and Lauren, we had the Nkuhuma Pride of the Lions. We Sumi, the young female, and even a glimpse of Maribs, the young male leopard. And across the board, it's been a lovely day of taking in scenery, plant life, and of course, all of our fantastic predators. Now, what we have found here is something I've been wanting to show you for ages. A beautiful orange yellow tipped flower called a paintbrush lily. I think it is the most perfect name for a lily I have ever come across. It looks just like a broad paintbrush or even a makeup brush that's just been dipped in a little bit of yellow paint right on the tips. And this one is busy closing for the evening. The sun has gone down. It is now officially behind the mountains and so all of the lilies are closing up and you can see just on the floor there's one that's already nice and safely tucked away. The one on top being a little bit higher had a little bit more sunlight for a smidge longer. And so it is starting to close slowly and should be closed within the next hour I would imagine. It's such a beautiful plant. A bulbous plant and very poisonous so maybe don't eat this one as pretty as it looks all right for now i'm going to send you back over to cedric in juma to see what he's got while we carry on and look for more flowers yes thanks tess i am just heading around now towards uh the other side to see if we can relocate on that young male leopard known as Marips, known as Fluffy Ears, also known as the Clown. So we are going to see if we can just to relocate on this side yeah, because we were losing a lot of light and there was no way we were getting a proper view on him anymore because it's just got completely dark and we are in infrared and the infrared light doesn't stretch far. Infrared Parameter is about what? Seven meters? Eight, ten meters? Up to thirty meters. Thanks, sorry. So your infrared's up to about thirty meter parameter around. So um, after that, it doesn't really reach that animal. Because that's one thing about wild which is very nice that we do not use, of course, our lights from the vehicles or the spotlights and that on the animals. We keep them as natural as possible with the lights and we don't disturb them oh nice okay well let's uh while well, we're going to try and relocate on this young male let's head over to let's head over to lauren she's got a chameleon this drive just keeps on getting better and better it's not the tiny one that i was hoping for I've been finding them a lot smaller than this. This is more adult size. But we found one. Clinging on for dear life. <laughs> I often feel sorry for them clinging on like that and then the wind blows and they just seem to blow about in the wind. And I mentioned the, the colour change a little bit earlier in that they do go very pale at night time, which is why we're able to see them. We, when we're shining our spotlight, if you look at a sort of a tree or a bush or even the grass, there's just all of a sudden this thing that almost looks like it's glowing in the dark. Now they are not glowing in the dark. They're just reflecting back off the spotlight and it makes them really easy to find, to be honest, in summer. And all ectotherms actually have specialized cells that do enable color change. And there are different types of color changing cells. And within chameleons, you will find they're called chromatophores, but you'll find xanophores, 
Xanophores are your yellow and red pigments. Now, chameleons can often have a really, um, the flat neck chameleon can often have a real orange chin when it's breeding, when it wants to signal to the ladies. Underneath, it will be really orange, and that's from the xanophores. Obviously, yellow and red make orange. So a mixture of those pigments will create that color. Then you have the iridophores. They are colorless. They're sort of colorless stacks of crystals, if you like. And because they're colorless, they reflect light. And normally the iridophores will produce blues and whites and UV, actually. We just can't see the UV colors. Melanophores, I think that's pretty obvious, but melanophores produce black pigments. So the chromatophores are the color changing cells within ectotherms. And the ones I just spoke about, you, that's a sort of breakdown into the different types of chromatophores that produce different colors. And it's wonderful to see the color change. It's slow, it's not like an octopus, but it is wonderful to see. Oh, see, look at them just blowing about in the wind. No, hold on. Macamillion? I'll go one more time with that name. I missed that name, but yes, he is thinking very deeply. And holding on for dear life. Max million. <laughs> I'm not doing too well tonight, am I? I'm feeling miserably. But I do wonder what what he is thinking about. That's a really interesting comment. I know it was a funny one, but I do often wonder what goes through different organisms' mind. I wish we could tap into it, and of course we just can't. Maximilian, maybe. <laughs> but I like Max Chameleon. So I think we should roll with that one. We've been celebrating the Safari Super Bowl and just going into the strengths and weaknesses of each organism and really trying to tap into their world. What makes them them? What is their superpower? It would just be so interesting to take that further and really see how the brain works cognitive abilities and intelligence in different species but we are so limited by who we are and we can't help that we can't possibly know what it's like to be all these other organisms we really only know what it's like to be us This is really just resting time, so this chameleon is just sleeping now, or trying to. Oh, Rolo, that is a very difficult question, and I'm not entirely sure I can answer it. However, once you get past the sort of layer of the ocean that we know so well where light does still marginally penetrate and you really start to go deep into the ocean it becomes the abyss absolutely no light penetrates down there so a lot of organisms make their own light and this can be from plankton that maybe have bioluminescence in them to sort of jellyfish and even organisms that we can't even imagine they have to produce their own light because there is no light it's a really dark, weird world down there that we don't really understand. But my favorite of all fish is the frogfish, sometimes called an anglerfish. And they actually have a very special appendage on their head that looks like a fishing rod. They're able to sort of um, erect it so it stands out. And at the end, there is what we call a lure. Now, it's not really a fishing lure, but what it does is it emits light and it also looks like... It looks like a fishing lure. 
The frogfish are very camouflaged, so they stay remarkably still. And what they'll do is erect out the sort of fishing rod appendage and dangle that lure. And the lure just moves. Oh my goodness, poor chameleon. <laughs> It's a windy one and just dangle the lure and a lot of fish don't see the frogfish. All they see is what they think is their prey and they'll swim across, try to eat it and bam, the frogfish comes out and eats them. So that glows in the dark, that little lure part. But there are lots of creatures that glow in the dark down there. I am afraid of heights, but I love depth. I love depth, but I have to say when I think of parts of the ocean that are that deep, that does terrify me. There's so many unknowns down there, so many bizarre creatures. But a lot of organisms in the ocean do contain bioluminescence. And it's such a wonderful thing. In the Maldives, they have this sort of phenomenon where all the plankton arrives in the southwest monsoon, which brings in the manta rays. And the plankton, oh my goodness, I feel really sorry for this chameleon and panda. The plankton contains bioluminescence. So during the day, you see nothing. You might feel it because it stings. Ugh. But at nighttime, we took everyone on our trip on a night snorkel. It's pitch black. You just jump in in your swimwear and you're given a torch. Now you obviously follow a guide, but all the nocturnal animals come out. It's like going on a night safari. What you see is different. The coral reef is completely different. It transforms. Then what we do is we make everyone move a little bit away from the reef. It's better to do this at new moon and not full moon. And we all stay in a circle. Then we all turn our lights off so you are plunged into darkness you cannot see anything there's very little light pollution in the Maldives and we ask everyone to wave their arms and legs like a crazy person like you're dancing in the water and look down and it's like a scene from the beach I don't know if you guys have seen the beach with Mr DiCaprio my good friend DiCaprio it's a fantastic movie and there's a scene where they swim in the bioluminescence and that is exactly what it looked like. You feel like you're swimming among the stars, but the stars are blue. Because what you've done is you have disturbed all the plankton and they've gone into defense mode and they have started to emit light. And this is called bioluminescence. And you can see it because it's a night snorkel. You can't see anything else. You can't see any of the people you're snorkeling with. You can't see any fish or sharks or stingrays. All you can see is a bioluminescence from the plankton that you are disturbing. And it is one of the most beautiful experiences that you can ever have. So, Rolo, I went pretty deep with that. <laughs> but all in all, I hope it answered your question. The chameleon looks, quite frankly, very bored. I'm sorry, little guy, you need to sleep and you don't glow in the dark. <laughs> I think he is actually sleeping. How can you sleep like that? Clinging on for dear life. Of course, he has to watch out for snakes. It's safer to be up in the tree than it is to be on the ground. Okay, what next do I want to find? Yes, look what we've got. We've got a painted reed frog. This was definitely something I was looking for for quite some time. We had a banded rubber frog the other day. Now we've got a painted reed frog. And the coloration is fantastic. Unfortunately, we are in infrared, but I can quickly give you a rundown on the colors. So, of course, the black is the black. Black is very black. And then, of course, you've got the inside with that lighter color. Um, You'll have pretty much like on, on the outskirts of that light color will be white and then on in the center will be like a yellow uh, line and that's the beautiful coloration of these frogs and they are absolutely stunning and they do a lot of timeshare and satellite calling. So timeshare calling 
is where one frog will call at a time, kind of sharing the time of their call, especially the males to attract the females to these little water holes, like little ponds and that, and little marshy areas. And of course, when you've got something like a satellite calling, satellite calling is when, of course, the frogs are calling from one water body through to the next water body. And that's what we call satellite calling. So yes, and no, they are very well known for that. But it's so nice to see them. And why they call the reed frog? Well, they enjoy reeds. They enjoy sitting very, very still on reeds. And when it's a hot day, now, they go completely white. It's amazing, completely white. And as soon as uh, there's cloud cover, as soon as there's like a, sh a shadow that's cast above them on a hot day, you'll slowly but surely they'll see this beautiful lime green yellowish color come through. And then they start turning that, that colors that you see right now. Absolutely amazing. But there is three subspecies with different colorations and they are recognized all in South Africa and all of them have these beautiful color patterns and correlate with the geographic distribution of those subspecies. So one thing I still haven't quite gotten used to about Amakala is how vast the property really is and how far things are apart. Now where we were with the cheetahs is far behind us. Where we are going is over this next hill and then over the next one and then we're where we're supposed to be. <laughs> so we've still got quite a distance to go but this viewpoint is yet another one that I have not seen. So Morgan just keeps pulling these viewpoints out of his sleeve like you can't believe. He knows this property so well already. And this one is particularly spectacular. We're a little bit lower down. We're not quite on top of the crest. We're just on the side as it's starting to go down into the valley. And it's just the sea of sweet thorn, white milkwood, and grassy patches. And just hills everywhere that we look. It is unreal, but from a view like this, <laughs> the distance is immense. Those mountains in the distance are still part of Amakala. <laughs> that is crazy. So if we want to see the lions, we're going to be getting going that way tomorrow over those mountains towards the big basin right at the bottom on the other side. So it's quite impressive how far apart, how, yeah, how far apart things can be. Now the nice thing is with the sun having gone down and the wind is still being really consistent, in fact getting harder, it has cooled down immensely. So I feel like this last little bit we might get lucky. The cheetahs were still flat, flat, flat. In fact, someone's just given a radio update letting us know that they got up, looked like they were going to move and then went straight back to sleep. So I don't feel too bad about having left them. But what might be moving now is things like brown hyena, art wolf, art fark, because it's cooled down enough and we're losing light. And that's the perfect time for those nocturnal animals to be waking up. Even the lions might be moving at this point. So hopefully they're going to use this nice cool weather. And tomorrow morning we might get lucky down in the basin. John, yes, the sun sets quite a bit later here in Amakala. It's about a 40 minute difference between sunset in Juma and sunset here in Amakala. In fact, we can still see light on the horizon. So we're looking out east towards where the sun would rise. The sun is setting behind us and there's still quite a bit of light. So we've still got a way to go until it gets completely dark. It's normally after 7.30, around quarter to 8 now, that it's dark enough that we need lights and a spotlight. 
so <laughs> it's very very different and that's because we're further west than Juma if you look at South Africa on the map Juma is a little bit further east it's in the northeastern side of South Africa where we are is on the southern coast but a little bit further west so we're closer to the sunset and further from the sunrise and also further south of course quite a lot further south and so we see a lot more of the sun during the day and especially in the evenings but it does take a while to get used to. <laughs> I know every time I go and leave from Juma, I come home to Port Alfred and I still think, what is the time? Like you don't realize how fast the time is going and you look at your watch, it's 8.30 and it's just gotten dark. And you think, oh my goodness, this was two hours ago in Juma. <laughs> we would have been home and having dinner. By the time it gets dark in Port Alfred, we're all getting ready for bed in Juma. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a difference quite a big difference. At five in the morning here it is still dark though for the sunrise. It's getting lighter but it's still quite dark when we wake up and kind of get ready to go out on drive. We still have to use lights in the mornings but by the time 5 30 in the morning comes around there's no need for lights anymore unless it's a very overcast day and it's bright bright bright. William, absolutely landscape structures can change due to rain. It's actually, it's part of the natural erosion process, believe it or not. So a lot of these valleys were formed from rain and a lot of the, the soil movements and things as well are due to rain. So you might have soils higher up on the crests that wash down into the valleys where they shouldn't normally occur. And that's usually from a process of erosion. This is not gonna be the kind of light rain that we experience here regularly at this time of the year this is going to be from the kind of floods that are kind of happening in the southern part of Kruger so that kind of rain down in the eastern cape would be a little bit more damaging purely because we have so many high crests and extremely low valleys that the speed of the water the speed picks up continuously it has a snowballing effect and so what would happen is that would cause a whole lot of landslides and in fact we lose so many roads and things here in the eastern cape I mean massive massive structures go down in the Eastern Cape when we have rains like that purely because the landscape isn't as flat as Juma so in this kind of area because it has the chance to build up that momentum it can be absolutely devastating and absolutely it can change the landscape you might find ridges completely disappear valleys become deeper and take part of those ridges with them so things can change however for a mass mass scale change so not just making the valleys deeper maybe making the crests a bit smaller adding a lot of erosion if you're wanting to change an entire mountain where it is now it's going to take a lot more than than those kinds of rains but there's always these small scale movements happening even from intense wind here you can see it in the road and in the sands you can see that the wind every single day that it's been windy has physically changed the surface of the road it's changed where the bumps are, it's changed the look of the road, it, it paints a clean slate with little mini sand dunes in it. So that is constantly happening and that will also be happening on a much larger scale across the board. So there's always change occurring, but how big of a change is really going to be the question and what will it take to cause such a big change. But a torrential downpour that lasted a while here would definitely cause some damage. We would like some serious rain though, just to try and fill everything up. Dark main lover, you're welcome. You have Morgan to thank for this one. Most of the viewpoints Morgan has shown me and he pointed this one out as we were driving through the sweet thorn thicket. <laughs> but Amakala is absolutely breathtaking. Every day, literally every single day, every single drive, it sometimes feels like every hour I'm seeing a new spot that I haven't seen before. So the vastness of this property is really hard to describe. But if I can say that I, I'm going to be here for a month, I'm leaving in almost, actually tomorrow is two weeks, which is really sad. But I'm leaving in two weeks and once that two weeks is up, I mean, I've been out on this reserve every single day for the entire month and I still won't have seen a fraction of it. <laughs> it's crazy. Absolutely. 
absolutely crazy. But this is actually quite impressive because a property of this size will easily rival the best national parks in Southern Africa, definitely in South Africa. And the more it expands, the larger it's gonna become. I mean, it's already massive in terms of the Eastern Cape. Imagine if most of these private reserves in the Eastern Cape could merge because a lot of them share fences. Imagine if that was a possibility. Imagine if that happened. It is always a possibility, but imagine if that actually came into fruition. We would have this mass of land that is protected and the Eastern Cape would be known as just the largest protected area in a province. Wild Earth is looking for unique wildlife sightings filmed by you. They can be old or new, from anywhere in the world, and filmed on a camera or on your phone. In return, we will give you cash, an opportunity to win a prize, and a chance to see your clip on TV, with your name in the credits. It's easy. Head over to wildearth.tv forward slash content to find out more. So unfortunately for us, we have had another day of no success with Art Wolf, Art Fark, or Brown Hyena. And all of those things were right at the top of my bucket list. I have two weeks left. We have to get this right, Morgan. We have to. We have to. We've been trying. We've been going to all of the usual spots. We've been doing everything that we can. And unfortunately, it is not working. But we know that they are here. There are obvious signs of them everywhere. This termite mound is a perfect example. It has been dug. Now it's not a massive termite mound. That's maybe 20 centimeters off the ground. Bearing in mind, majority of it is gonna be underground. So what we can see is literally the tip of the iceberg. And it makes me kind of sad. That I'm seeing evidence but I'm not seeing any of the animals themselves but this whole section here has been dug away you can see on the ground it's been flattened this is where the sand has been scooped it's a little termite mound but it's so valuable in terms of food so I can see it's still loose on the sides all I can do is hope Jennifer I really 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 hope 
that we're gonna get this right. <laughs> We've been trying so hard. We've been trying. And it looks like, I mean, that's not an, a super fresh digging like I had the other day where I could actually scoop the sand out. But it's been dug now in these last rains, which is what, three days ago, Morgan, four days ago? And we had rain last night. So we're in the right area. Find a way into, into the kill to eat, get their fill in there as well. But they're also gonna be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys. We're just taking frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. Myself and Sebastian were looking for the Birmingham Pride sub adults, and we just found them stealing a hoisted baby impala carcass out of a tree. This is incredible. It's the first time I've seen one of these youngsters. Whoa! Quite a good chunk there. <laughs> Nearly fell out doing it. <gasps> she might fall backwards. <laughs> She's actually lowering herself down the tree. It's the first time I've seen a lion do that in person. I think we just lost a uh, Tessa there. But uh, yes, as you can see, we are just uh, framing up some trees. And it is a silver cluster leaf tree. What's amazing about the silver cluster leaf tree, this is one of the things now that it is very important for us as guides is to know when there is a seep line. So after all this rain that we've had and you see a silver cluster leaves, uh, you never go off-roading where there's silver cluster leaf thickets because that is a seep line. You are going to get bogged down and uh, we're not talking about a seep line means that there is uh, rocks underneath the ground and there's a little bit of sand on top of the rocks and of course when the water comes through here it doesn't sink completely it doesn't go deep the water stays very close to the surface and then of course it creates this typical seep line so yes this is definitely a fantastic indicator of a seep line the silver cluster leaf but yes, uh, thank you so much once again for all the questions and comments and suggestions and even the information that everybody has sent through to us this afternoon on our sunset safari. I'm hoping that we have kept you guys all entertained here at a wild earth. And well, it's been a quite a tough one this afternoon, but luckily we've got uh, Lauren had the fantastic sightings of uh, some cats there on uh, Chitwa. We had on Marips at this side. Of course, Tess and Amakala had the cheetahs. So yes, it has been a brilliant, brilliant game drive once again. But please make sure that you do tune in tomorrow morning for our sunrise safari. And I'm hoping that we can show you some more amazing and special animals and sightings that we do have here in the African wilderness. From the Wild Earth team, a very, very good night or afternoon or morning to everybody.